Hi everyone, my name is Albert Corrado and I, along with my co-hosts Leah Stone and Andrew Warren, host a podcast dedicated to the San Fernando Valley. That's right folks, an entire podcast about the 818. It's called 818s and Heartbreak and it's available on all major podcast apps. We have done episodes about Game Dude, about City Walk, about the Topanga Plaza, about Lake Balboa Park. We've even done episodes about the Valley Secession Movement and the Manson Family's Valley Roots. We are three Valley kids who are obsessed with the Valley and who know that it is the great jewel of Southern California. So if you love the Valley, this is the show for you. So find us on a podcast app or find us online. We are at 818 Heartbreak on Instagram and Twitter. 818 and Heartbreak, there's the name again. We hope you listen and we hope you enjoy. 818 till we f***ing die. Okay, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I do not feel like doing any research for October. I just want to have a good time. I want to Halloween it up. Okay, I was survived 2020. I deserve one month of no research. I demand it. That's why we're here to ask you to do our research for <laughs> us. As we've talked about in the last couple episodes, I think our November episode is going to be based around a listener question mm-hmm. we got, and we want to hear your answers. We'll answer them too, so you won't feel so yeah. alone and yeah. naked saying whatever horrible yeah. things you're going to tell us to read that yeah. you wrote. But we want your answers to the following question. Why, when there are any number of towns and cities in the U.S. to live in, do people want to be in L.A.? Beyond the restaurants and museums, what are the things that are intrinsic about L.A. that make people want to live and work here? The things that bind you to the place, the things that are so elemental to your understanding of L.A. as home, that it is hard for you to even conceive of yourselves being anywhere else. What is the California dream that draws you here. You can send that to our email, la.meekly at gmail.com or Twitter at lameekly or Instagram la underscore meekly. Or our website, lameeklypodcast.com You could send us a message there as well. There's a contact form on there. Mm -hmm. So send us your answer to that question uh, so we don't have to do research and we can have a frank discussion with you. Frankenstein. Oh my god, Greg. It's gonna be November so that doesn't work. It's (laughs) frankincense. It's bordering on (laughs) frankincense. Okay. Frank and turkey. (laughs) Mind meld. All right. We got it. killed that guy <laughs> what, <laughs> what is, you're gonna make people think this is an intro Greg. <laughs> i don't know what you just reenacted you were watching me do a bugle boy and you weren't jumping in so i'm like do you hate this so then i killed him because i'm used to you saying this is the episode we we or the the, the, the show the that podcast will have you saying why is the sun red today because there's a fire in northern california that's why so i shot the bugle boy what do you want i'm just trying to make you happy uh yeah this is our uh october episode yes it is uh so we thought, uh, hey, we want a spooky sort of overcast kind of day, but we know no rain is coming. So we started a fire in Northern California. We tried to kill General Sherman, the tree, <laughs> the tree this time. We killed a man and they're like, that's not the one we're talking about. Like, oh, they put a hit out on a tree. They told us we couldn't try to assassinate General Sherman, the person <laughs> they didn't specify. But Greg, I have yes. to say, welcome to L.A. Meekly, the podcast had a love you saying, where the hell are the intros? <gasps> oh my God, I didn't even notice. Just like all of the other listeners, except for <laughs> Emilio. <laughs> Emilio and three others. No. <laughs> we have to address the elephant that isn't in the room. <laughs> and believe me, if we were still it's doing intros, elephant. intros, there would have been an elephant yeah, in this yeah. one. There's an elephant we're not tediously washing in the room right now. <laughs> you may or may not have noticed yeah. that uh, as you skip forward 10 seconds on your iPhone, uh, suddenly you're too deep into the episode yeah. because there are no intros the last couple episodes. Yep. Uh, would you care to explain why? <laughs> Uh, Greg? I'll try not to froth at the mouth when I talk about them. Uh, I just thought that it was maybe time to retire them. We haven't heard a lot of feedback on them. We- and we didn't want to deter uh, new listeners with our wackiness. And as much as I enjoy writing silly things with you, I believe that those belong in another place. So those we're working belong on- in a museum <laughs> of 
comedy. So Daniel and I are working on another project where those would be- would fit a little bit better. The biggest thing for me was that I do worry, I did worry that those would turn off because if someone's like, ooh, a LA History podcast yeah. about the Zoot Suit riots and then you turn it on and there's a crazy commercial for Zoot Suits going on, you might not get past 30 seconds into the episode. You might get up and go, Pinocchio. <laughs> <laughs> which is something that only you and I remember because only you and I listen to the intros because they're only for us. And that was a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of work. It was a lot of work. And now that we are doing, like you said, we're going to be doing a brand new show that will be 80% intros. <laughs> <laughs> and also we're, we're working on videos mm-hmm. and we're doing the music stuff. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was a lot of work for us to do. And it was really, it made me, I know you were probably doing jumping jacks for a week when we stopped doing it, but I yeah. It was very sad. I didn't want to let people down who mm-hmm. did like them because there were people who liked them. Yeah, there was a couple of people. But there, uh, there more than a couple. Uh, <laughs> maybe like cube that number. Uh, but four. <laughs> uh, cube, Greg. I think that's eight. It might be six. I don't know. <laughs> Bottom line, it. I we want to uh, we want to grow this a mm-hmm. little bigger, and it might have been a turnoff. It might not have been the right place for that. Yeah, we're yeah. not saying they're gone forever. Yeah. Maybe they will come back. But it, I mean, uh, we were basing a lot of our decision on whether people burn the city down if they didn't hear an intro. Uh, well, there is smoke in the sky. I think they <laughs> the burned sun. the wrong city down. <laughs> uh, uh, Northern California, meekly. Can't know what. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. It was because I was. I was really proud of most of those yeah. and I had a lot of fun doing them with you but it was a lot of work and yeah. it might not have been the right place for them and I didn't want to let you down even though uh, every chance I got to trash them and rip them apart Tasmanian devil style I would I do it I edited that out I didn't want to let you down but I, I think that we should be doing I think that belongs in a better museum and it will and it yes. will be in a better museum yeah, it'll be in a better museum <laughs> it's gone to a better place <laughs> but yeah so we just wanted to explain that and uh well you'll you'll have weird stuff yeah. soon and hey. it's going to, now that we won't even have the filter of like maybe this shouldn't be too weird because people are here for history they're going to be weird intros or not people still have to deal with us going on insane There's, rants yeah, this, about whatever we want and no one's here to stop us because we don't have a bus <laughs> like general sherman <laughs> <laughs> general sherman he walks in that's our boss uh, you're yes, not sir <laughs> Get up and he talks like one of the Ents from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Look, we addressed we addressed that. Mm-hmm. Let's uh, welcome in our new uh, Patreon person this month. We want to welcome them. And this is a name I know I'm going to get wrong. So okay. welcome to our new Patreon. Say it fast. Say it fast so nobody can detect that you said it wrong. Like an Ent? <laughs> Those one of the shrouded that's figures, what, right? <laughs> say it like a ring wraith. Like a, <laughs> a ring wraith. Uh, a, 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 a ringwald. <laughs> say it like Molly Ringwald. <laughs> Molly Ringwraith. And that's the sort of thing you can expect in our new show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So welcome to our new Patreon person, Cry Shell. Jeffrey, Melissa told me it's Chrishell, but I want to say it's Cry Shell. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining our Patreon. I hope to send you a postcard real soon. Uh, I actually wrote hers today. Oh my um, God. Wait, you haven't, did you even do the list yet? I'm, I forgot to tell you. you s- <laughs> S-O-B. I forgot to tell you, I'm doing all of them this month. I I can't get enough of writing postcards. I got Adderall. I wrote all the postcards for the rest of the year. Um, I got a rock of cocaine. (laughs) Uh, uh, so yeah, if you want your name mispronounced by us and get a postcard every month, you can sign up on our Patreon for $5 a month or more or less, but you won't get postcards for less, Yes, but you will get postcards for more, but still only one postcard. <laughs> let's talk about it's, it's October, yes. but before we get real spooky, let's talk about what we did in the past month okay. of Beautiful. September. Okay. I went to the Starlight Bowl in the beautiful hills of Burbank and oh, I really? watched the Fab Four. Oh, that's where it was. Fantastic show. Uh, they put on a great show. I was worried they were only a new early Beatles. Not that I don't like that, but they did the whole... <laughs> Just the silver Beatles? Yeah, I thought it was playing Pete Best. Yeah, no, they, it was a fantastic show. I don't know why, but like... They had a bunch of monkeys jokes and it made me laugh so much. It could have been that I, had, again, had half a bottle of wine in me. Um, <laughs> You're drinking Trader, that monkey juice. <laughs> and that Trader Joe's uh, cheese bites, which are so good. I bought tickets for the show a month in advance and it was for the Starlight Bowl, which I never heard of. And I thought, a bowling alley? And then I bought <laughs> tickets and it was like, oh, the lawn, the lawn. At a bowling alley? The bowling, bowling lawn? And it not until I was sitting down like bowl, like the Hollywood Bowl. <laughs> oh my God. And I never thought the Hollywood Bowl was a bowling alley, but I was sure that the Starlight Bowl was a bowling alley. That's why you brought your bowling ball <laughs> when we went to see uh, the Simpsons show. Because you had described it to me, but you, I think you told me like, yeah, I'm going to some bowling alley in Long Beach <laughs> and I'm seeing the Beatles. <laughs> 
think George Martin's going to be there. Um, yeah, it was it was a great show. Yeah, Fat Four are fantastic. They're really funny. They, you know, from a distance looked like the Beatles. They sound like the Beatles. I realized that- They smell like the Beatles. They yeah. taste like the Beatles. I didn't even, I was enjoying it so much. I didn't even need a band to be playing. If I just went to the park with a bunch of people and they turned on a radio with the Beatles, so, I would have just had a good time You could have well. just put on breakfast with the Beatles. <laughs> with the, in the park with people and I would have had a good time. But it was a great show. So you were saying, okay, because my experience, my only experience with the Starlight Bowl, speaking of Halloween, which is not the month we're talking about yet, I've only been there for, because every year, except for uh, when there's global pandemics, right. they have done a walk through a haunted maze. Oh, okay. And uh, it's great. Like you go through the sta- the seating, you go oh, through right. the stage, you really? go through backstage, you go through that little area behind it. And it's so much fun. But I've never been to a show there. Oh, I, o- I only, do they still have the guy with the chainsaw? Is yeah, he yeah, still- yeah. He's <laughs> handing out tickets and he won't put the chainsaw down. You kind of have to reach past it. Well, one time, the first time we went there, I don't know what was going on, but they didn't figure out the spacing very well. So basically it was like... Like you were waiting in line in to, the thing already in the thing yeah so like you'd walk around a corner and freddy krueger would come out yeah. and go like eh. yeah and then you'd just be standing there and he'd be like mm, yeah, well all right, right. <laughs> and then he'd just like lean back against the wall yeah and you just stand there and watch him scare the other people when they come around the corner but uh I, yeah i've wanted to you were in, like a dream you're having you that were, he would be in you were on the, the lawn area of it no i wasn't i was in oh. the seating area but i because we were looking at pictures i didn't see the stones or i, I don't know nope, it's not we didn't see the rolling stone <laughs> they had a fake ultimate it was really bad <laughs> Um, False to Monty. <laughs> they had the, the seating area and we were in the seating area. But when I looked on pictures online, it looked like it was all lawn. And that sounded, you know, we brought our picnic basket and a sarape and we're like, oh, this is like seats. You put like lawn chairs on the yeah. the bench seating there. Yeah. My advice, get there early and then park near if i mean we weren't allowed to pick where we park but we got really lucky that we they stacked parking so i hear the parking is awful, awful trying to get there, out of yeah there. so a lot of people are walking up the hill but it's you know the hills of glendale so it's like just steep yeah uphill. and there's one yeah there's one narrow road to yeah, get one narrow uh, road to get there uh one narrow road to rule them all yeah and in the <laughs> darkness molly ringwald the Al- ring she's got ring in her name she's she's perfect for lord of the rings why wasn't molly ringwald in lord of the rings she could have been any character any character you know who else could have been in it Ringo Star. Um <laughs> fake Ringo Star. <laughs> Get there early and just try to park near an edge where you can just bail out. Because we yeah. got very lucky to park at an edge where we just we left during Hey Jude and <laughs> You left during the twentieth minute of Hey Jude. Yeah, yeah. We left right at the middle of na 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 the mixer is saying it's more of a kinks fan. There's a new level. There's like four <laughs> bars, and then there's a fifth one for dumb. Yeah, I think I've I think I've seen the Fab Four, right? Or I might I might have seen Ticket to Ride. I think I've seen Ticket to Ride. Mm-hmm. I thought maybe I saw the Fab Four. Okay. Yeah, you were saying Fab. You're like, oh, you mean the Fab Four? I'm like, no, the other one. No, the real one. The- <laughs> Paul's with them. The real Paul who didn't die in 1968. <laughs> uh, well, my thing of the month yes, is it's sort of Beatles related okay. because uh, we went on a hike in Topanga. Canyon. Oh wow! Okay. And Tep- oh, okay. Topanga Canyon is like a hippie commune. Yeah. It's so weird because normally when we've gone there. I have been the one driving yeah. and this time I wasn't so I could look around uh-huh. and it's pretty weird up there. Yeah. Like everyone, it smells like marijuana everywhere. Okay. It smells like Altamont <laughs> and there's, there's just like weird art all over the place yeah. and signs of just like peace and love and oh all this God. You crazy sound stuff. like you just signed up to fight in Vietnam. Where are the buzz cuts? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we went to Topanga State Park. Park. Okay. And we took uh, quite literally the advice you say to us all the time take, oh, take a hike. A hike. Uh, take a hike, Buster. We went early, of like, it's not going to be that hot. We're going early. I was dehydrated for like three days. <laughs> and it, it's so weird. Like, it's a, in better weather, yeah. I could see it being real because we could see the ocean. Mm-hmm. Like, we could see Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. The only thing why it was so hot is because there was zero shade because of whatever wildfire oh, right. from like two years ago. It's right. just go back to Lord of the Rings, desolation of smog. <laughs> it's just like charred earth and like yeah. like the tr- how trees look when they've been burned and they yeah, just yeah, like they toothpicks. Look, uh, and- they look like the Charlie Brown Christmas tree. I've always wanted to do that hike, but yeah, not in August or not September a, or whatever you did. Not during the it. global warming global, summer? Yeah, not when the planet's on fire. Because I know that you don't like hikes. So you told me like, I went on a hike and I remember looking at you like, uh-huh. <laughs> 
and then you're like, Melissa said it's the one for the year. I'm like, that's what, it, okay. That's yeah. what I expected the next sentence to I, be. I allow her one every year. <laughs> the biggest tragedy was that I stupidly put on my Triforce earring oh, right. and I had to keep taking on and off my mask because people just like crowd the trail with no right. mask on and we have to like jump into a rattlesnake's mouth to get out of their way. So I kept taking my mask on and off and one of those times, mm -hmm. my Triforce earring oh my must God. have gotten knocked. So somewhere on the Topanga Trail, the Triforce is waiting for you. Well, if you get enough coins, you can get it back. <laughs> If you have enough courage, you may be able to get it. Um, you can trade a shield for it, I think. Um, I haven't played the game since I was like five, which is the last time you're supposed to play that game. Um, um, well, that's rude. Uh, <laughs> I guess you don't have the Triforce of Wisdom uh, because that was pretty ignorant what you just said. Uh, but don't, everybody, don't worry. I have a second Triforce hearing. <laughs> But that third one, if it falls into the wrong hands, oh boy. Oh boy. Will I have to ask my brother to help me beat the level? <laughs> <laughs> I bought a uh, Nintendo gamer uh, to try to find my uh, Triforce earring again, but they told me they stopped printing them. So that was our November, and now yep. we're in... No. Uh, that was our September. Oh my God. Have I time jumped again? Have I been in the temple of time or something? <laughs> Did I play the wrong note on my ocarina? Uh, which by the way, uh, there is an ocarina in that closet. Oh, I right bet. There. I'm so curious to see what's in this closet right next to Daniel. There's at least I know there's a trumpet, there's, an unplayed trumpet. A, oh, come on, Greg. I, speaking of Lord of the Rings, I used to play, I have the sheet music to Lord of the Rings and I would play a little bit on the trumpet. Okay. You want to hear the Shire theme okay. right now? Um, play it real loud because it'll, it'll play over the sound of me starting my car to leave. I love that you're you're like, speaking of Lord of the Rings, you're the only one speaking of Lord of the Rings. I haven't brought it up one time. Well, I didn't say who was speaking of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it's being spoken right now. Me speaking of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> so someone's speaking of Lord of the Rings. Uh, that was September. Yes. So now we're in October. Well, but we'll have a listener question at the end. Yes. We're in October. The spookiest month. Absolute spookiest month. The three last weeks of summer. Even though it said today or yeah. yesterday was technically the first day of fall. I say that it's hot up to the week of Halloween and then suddenly it, it gets real cold. It gets really windy yeah. and all the leaves fall. Uh, with global warming, summer gets like, in a soccer game, they just add like a random amount of extra time at yeah, the yeah, end yeah. to settle things. Yeah. Uh, we're in the extra time of summer right now. Right, but also imagine they did that at the beginning of the game too. Imagine just imagine the whole game was sort of overtime. <laughs> uh, and, and it's sudden death overtime as well. That's summer in LA. Summer on the planet is looking like... Uh, see you never. Smell you later, planet. <laughs> Smell you now, wildfires. <laughs> I'm fully on the planet side now. Like, you do it. I keep looking up good news and it's always about animals. I'm like, that's uh, not a good sign. <laughs> Anyways, October is the spooky uh, month. Uh, this month will be a spooky in a different way, uh, Court, if Greg will have his way. I'm just going to read the climate report. Spooky. <laughs> so we don't do our haunted yes. stuff in um, October. October. We so always do Halloween related. Yeah, or spooky, uh, Halloween adjacent yes, things. Thank you. Uh, your candy, your mm -hmm. graveyards, your uh, razor blades, <laughs> <laughs> your, your monster magazines, your monster movie studios, your uh, pillowcases, your pillow bursting cases. at the seam with goodies. The company that makes monster masks and monster mashes. I was working in the lab late one night making a monster mask. I was working in the factory late one night uh, because Amazon wouldn't give me uh, any time off. Um, this time we did in the past the Universal Monsters. Yes, so this this episode will sort of be like a sister episode to that one. We yeah. did, uh, I dare say, Bride of that oh, episode. Uh, oh, the Bride of uh, uh, the Monsters and the Nerds uh, that Love Them where we covered the Universal Monster movies and Forrest Ackerman and the famous monsters of Filmland magazine. But mostly in the monster portion of all that, we focused on like Bill Lugosi. Right, uh, right, right. Uh, I was going to call him Frankie Ste Fra Frank Frankie Avalon. Avalon <laughs> Frank Steinberg. <laughs> uh, yeah, this time we're going to go a little uh, deeper. A little bit uh, deeper. Uh, um, uh, into the, uh, under the flesh. Um, uh, six feet deeper. <laughs> I did surfer hands as I... You did, did. everything surfer. <laughs> is this a point break character I didn't get to see? Yeah. I, uh, ago? This is the one that wears the Frankenstein mask. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about the people, basically the spe the makeup effects yeah, and the makeup. special effects people. Mm -hmm. Three in particular yes. of those iconic movies and a few other uh, Halloween-y related right. iconic sort of movies. Right. We, we picked three of the most well-known and one of them's not as well-known but she's becoming more well-known yeah. so we'll cover that and you're going to start us off. Let's kick this off. Wow. You've been listening to podcasts lately. I could tell. You, you That lingo. You're talking like a some young punk. Let's lock the gates on this one. <laughs> I'm Richard McLean. Smith. <laughs> 
Say it all together. And I feel spooky about being Conan <laughs> O'Brien's friend. All right, let's get started with my first one. Okay. We all know the creature from the Black Lagoon. Personally, yes. Okay, if we've all met him, we've all had uh, our dealings with it. It's yeah. like it's like seeing Angeline. You've all right, seen right, him. Right, right. He's in a suit. He walks around town. But have you ever heard of the Crete her from the Black Lagooness? This one's a... Uh, <laughs> How do I stop the episode? There is, is there, there breaks? Is, there's always my way to stop the episode, <laughs> Halloween. This one's about another entry in the long world history of unsung women who are responsible for some of the best things in the world, Millicent Patrick. Yay! Or as she was born on November 11th, 1915, Mildred Elizabeth Fulvia of De Rossi. Wow. That's a way spookier countess name. And that she didn't go for that is tricky. According to her, it's more of a baroness name, Whoa. which we'll get into a little bit later. G.I. Joe reference that I only know by name. Go ahead. There's someone in G.I. Joe named the Baroness? Yeah. Like the Queen song? Yeah. For sure. Just like a baroness. All right, if you uh, say so. I feel like I've been referencing a lot of uh, songs from the 80s uh, in the last couple episodes that are going over, 80s and 70s that are going over your head. Yeah, you're, you're giving me some ABBA Queen deep yeah, cuts. And yeah. I'm like, all right. Yeah. It's not I think it's from, I mean, it's think it's from Killer then. Queen, <laughs> uh, the song that's on the radio every four minutes. But anyway, uh, yes. this lady was born in El Paso, Texas. Wow. Was, we'll, we will hold that against her. Yeah, no, she is definitely not a queen. <laughs> Maybe a yes queen. <laughs> Please keep reading. I'm trying to inject more uh, current lingo into the show. Uh, as you might have guessed by the last uh, two thirds of her name, her dad was from Italy, but he came to America and became a structural engineer. Wow. After Mildred was born, his job took the family from South America to New York City and everywhere in between, like El Paso, Texas. <laughs> uh, but when she was six, he got hired to help build some crazy castle for some lunatic in some nonsense place called San Simeon. So off to work, her dad went to build Hearst Castle oh my God. for William Randolph Hearst. <laughs> oh my God. That's how I know Sam Simeon. Yeah. Or as it was officially called La Cuesta and Cantada and as he was officially known Citizen Kane. Her dad was the construction superintendent and he wow. worked directly beneath Julia Morgan who was the mm -hmm. designer of the castle and uh, she was also the first licensed woman architect in California. Julia Morgan? Julia Morgan. Okay. What this meant for Mildred was that she spent a lot of time on the grounds of Hearst Castle as a kid which meant unlimited access to a whole private zoo and a never-ending stream of glamorous Hollywood celebrities. Private zoo of a different kind, but nah. I'm, I'm not here. I'm not here to get political. <laughs> she also, the elitists are ruining this country. Go ahead. Eat the rich. Uh, she, she also changed her name at this time to Millicent okay. because she loved the Hearsts and Millicent was the name of Citizen Hearst's wife. Oh, wow. Okay. Unfortunately, Millicent's uh, dad, the little girl, was a spicy immigrant who liked to fight and argue and was described by his boss, Julie Morgan, as someone who seemed to glory in human misery. Cool. That, this was Millicent Patrick's dad. What a cool guy to yeah. be under the control. Of. Yeah. I, <laughs> I love that for her. How sad. Yeah. There's a lot of parts in her story that are very disturbing. Yeah. Eventually, this took a toll on his job, his uh, gloating in human misery. <laughs> and after 10 years of working on Hearst Castle, he got fired, which sounded to me like that's a pretty like how long was he expecting to work on it until yeah. I realized it took them 28 years to build Hearst Castle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't even get to, he got fired not even halfway through the job. They weren't even in the pool yet. They were still working on the elephant pen. <laughs> After this, the family moved to good old Glendale, California. Whoa. Why? I have no idea. But if I had to guess, I'd say the Americana. <laughs> uh, to live near two Zankus. <laughs> to be so close to both a Fuddruckers and a Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> Irresistible to an Italian man. <laughs> but this was great for Mildred because she really liked art and drawing. Right. And not far from Glendale was the House of the Mouse. The component of the rodent, <laughs> Disney. Real close. Shockingly close. Very close by. Uh, Mildred ended up getting three scholarships to Chouinard Art Institute, which wow. is now CalArts, which was a like basically a farm team for Disney animators. Right, right. And when she graduated from high school, supposedly she was 14 when she graduated from high school. High school different right now? Uh, yeah, high school meant elementary school. <laughs> she was really far behind. She played her cards right. And in 1939, at age 23, she was hired by the mouse of the house, mm -hmm. the rodent of the component, right, Disney mouse. Mouse. Yeah. <laughs> so she, at what age she got? Sorry, I'm completely She's 23 story. now. She's 23 and she got hired by the mouse. She, she was caught in the trap. Uh, yeah, she she just couldn't resist <laughs> that cheese, that a trail of cheese leading from the Americana to downtown Burbank.
think, and she fell right for it, as so many others have after her. She was hired into the ink and paint department, which was Mm -hmm. where they would reproduce the designs of the animators onto celluloid frame by frame by frame by frame by frame by frame. frame. Fantastic book called Ink and Paint about all the women who worked in that department. That that's uh, let me finish my joke. Um, This isn't a joke. Uh, it's a joke to be alive. Fair wages. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a joke in the celestial sense. <laughs> um, so they would do that for tens of thousands of hours divided among about a hundred workers. And yep. each person could do about eight to 10 cells per hour. So even with a whole team working, you'd get about a minute of screen time done in one full work day, yep. which is insane. But like you said, what was really significant about this department, other than the borderline torture, it was uh, to have to do that work was that it was staffed entirely by women. Yes. They had their own building and, and they were known as the ink and paint girls. Mm-hmm. Fantastic, hardworking women. Yeah, who got, got, got their own. Women always have it so easy. <laughs> they got their own, but they didn't have to share a toilet with Ooh <laughs> Iwerks. <laughs> and you're telling me this. I'm like, I wonder if she knew Mary Blair. Did they work at the same time? Do you think they were friends? If Mary Blair and Mills and Patrick were friends, that'd be really cool. I like I like making your fan fiction, your history fan, fan fiction history about fan who, fiction worked at Disney. who worked together. <laughs> Do you think um, uh, Donald Duck or no? Wait, Donald wait, which Duck. I always mix, mix up. Donald which... Duck is Disney. Okay. Daffy Duck is Looney Tunes. Uh, do you think Donald Duck ever met Daffy Duck? Um, <laughs> this was as close as most women got to being involved in the animation process right. at Disney until old Millie came along and somehow she made such an impression that she was promoted to becoming a full-fledged animator, making her, according to her at least, the first female animator at Disney. But even if that isn't true, she was certainly one of the first. Right. Either way, it's- Top in, 10. Yeah. Either way, it's incredibly impressive. Yes. It, to become an animator at Disney is also very impressive. Right. E- even now. <laughs> um, trust me, I I was uh, I was talking to someone about like about like having applied for new jobs and stuff, and I've applied for a few, mm-hmm. and one of them was at Disney, and I haven't heard back from any of them. The only one I heard back from was I got an email from Disney with like the Mandalorian and Mickey Mouse on it, telling me your resume is not impressive enough to work no. here. <laughs> if the Mandalorian wants to come and tell me that, he come tell me that. If that's he knows the message, where to find yeah, me. He knows where to find me. I dare him to show <laughs> his face on uh, Canto Bite again. So her first big assignment as an animator was a little project that would one day, decades later, become a very well-used VHS in the Zaffron household, starring a certain mousy little magician, <gasps> Leopold Stokowski. <laughs> That's right. She was a part of what's probably one of the best movies ever made, 1940s Fantasia. Wow, really? For this project, she pioneered a style of diluting paint that made it have more of like a pastel texture to it, which she used on the section of the movie that she was working on, Night on Bald Mountain. Oh, wow. That was, I don't know if she, that was, Obviously, it's not only her, but this is the scariest part of that or any Disney movie ever made for the next 80 years. Yeah, yeah. And you can really see this effect that I was talking about in it, especially in the demon Chernabog, Mm -hmm. which is the first brush Millicent had with working on and designing a monster for a movie. That is one of the most iconic monsters in any movie. Is that always scared me. That, yeah. that part of the movie was so scary. The only me. part of it I wanted to watch was the part. You're forgetting the dancing hippos. <laughs> <laughs> that was the scariest part for you. You hate it when animals act inappropriately. I, do, do, do what you're good at. Do what you do. Do what you do. I'm not here to watch you. Stay in your lane, hippos. <laughs> the watch- tutus are mine. <laughs> you gotta be naked. I gotta wear clothes. I get song and dance. You just walk around. How about that? That's the rule of man and versus animal. How about an alligator feeds me some grapes? <laughs> Obviously, that whole movie is... Yeah. Uh, perfect but yeah that's such a and I was watching some clips of it in doing this research Mm -hmm. it's so cool like that part that is such a scary part of that movie and it's weird to think like oh this woman no one talked about until five years ago uh, did this it's weird that the other person other than you that watched it every day for a while was Ray Bradbury <laughs> who would go on and work in the field with another person we're going to talk to today who was his best man. Oh, so you've been reading my research. <laughs> you leave it in front of me? Of course I'm going to read it. So I'm going to pretend to sign stuff. I always look at, is this yeah. a will? Is this a, what is this? A double indemnity clause? Uh, yeah. I have a courier bring my research to you every month just so you can sign off on it. One of these days, I will. Uh, you'll, you'll be signing your own death sentence. So after this, after working on Fantasia, she also worked on a certain movie from 1941 starring a certain stupid elephant named Dumbo. She worked on Dumbo? He's not stupid. He's young. Uh- Great. Oh, oh, What's oh. the difference? Nah. He's a naive, naive. He's a naive, naive elephant. I'll give you well, well, the middle ground. Low is- IQ. 
he's naive about how stupid he is. These are two of the biggest projects that came out of the mouse house. Yeah, and she was, I don't know what she did for Dumbo. I guess she she probably just drew Chernobog into every... <laughs> <laughs> I've got a crazy idea about what's under the big top. <laughs> I know who can save him from the circus. <laughs> he, he, he. That's how Mills and Patrick sound like. I think that this pink elephant should have fangs and maybe like a knife that you can't see <laughs> and what if he had gills like, e- eat this up uh to karina longsworth <laughs> we can do voices too Ooh, hey i'm millicent patrick <laughs> do you have any blood i can bathe in i might be mixing up stories <laughs> but greg her yes. time at disney was brief uh for as much as she did do 1941 also marked the notorious disney animator strike but millicent oh, was already right. she was already mostly gone by then it seems because the animation work was giving her a headache <laughs> like the stress of it or like keeping I, I my think, eyes in one space I for a long keeping time keeping your eye in space for, for one time like she just didn't want to do it but what, what a what a healthy decision it is but here before you decide whether or not this is a healthy decision yeah. wait for the second part of why she stopped working there. okay it wasn't quite so elegant because while she was there she began an affair with a fellow animator named paul fitzpatrick <laughs> whose pregnant wife soon found out about their affair and then took her own life and their unborn baby wow. with her. And after this, Paul and Millicent decided to cope with that by getting married. Oh, okay. And then got divorced just a couple right. of years later. That, that would happen after that. Yeah, so, I, uh, I don't see that working out. AKA a headache. A headache. Uh, that's very, very dramatic and dark. Yes, it, it, there's another part of her story that is also very dark. Okay. Uh, darker than Chernobog. So I'm talking darker than Chernobog, Greg. <laughs> this changed Millicent's life in two ways that her family pretty much disowned her because of this affair. Mm-hmm. And also she decided for whatever reason to keep her married name, oh. but only part of it. So now she became Millicent Patrick. Okay. I don't know why she took off the fits. She, May, if I'm allowed to be rude, uh, you got to shave the ethnic off of that. Yeah, I know. She got married in Ellis Island and <laughs> this is what happened. Fits? No, no, we can't have that. That actually doesn't fit. Uh, <laughs> you're Patrick now. Both names that aren't really hers. So now she right. was basically just this made up person. Hell yeah. Um, Fem- Fatal stuff. Having had her fill of animation, Millicent decided to put another of her god given talents to work, namely her face and her body. She was a good looking woman, so mm. she started doing modeling in oh, wow. ads and commercials. She won Miss Contour at a beauty contest in the Ambassador Hotel. <laughs> I love that contest. Yeah. Miss Contour is, I mean, she would get it if she's a makeup person, they, she they, would get it. They had like a giant hourglass with like just the outline of it. If you could walk through it without <laughs> touching it, you win Miss Contour. How worse and cartoonish my brain as you did with your hands the hourglass and my brain was like (laughs) I saw the tongue hang out of your mouth when I did that beating my head with a shoe for some reason when you did that now I got you confused and you're looking at me and fantasizing a ham hawk for some reason ha cha cha (laughs) roll up your tongue this is a professional podcast (laughs) this is a 40s cartoon (laughs) Put your eyes back in their socket. <laughs> um, for some reason, she also started claiming that she was an Italian baroness, mm. an Italian baroness named Baronessa di Polombara, which by all accounts seems to not be true. Yeah. There, there's so little really known about Millicent Patrick yeah. that like there must have been a reason for her to start right, doing this. Right. But but it's also the West and you can reinvent yourself. I hear people like talk about stuff like that and like, oh, it's so mysterious what we're thinking. You just change your name because you want to change it because you're in she, California and everyone's yeah. got weird names. Look at Angeline. Look at Angeline, the model <laughs> behavior at- who wasn't even born yet. But yeah, yeah. Uh, Look it- at future Governor Angeline. <laughs> Excuse me. So I mentioned Angeline. I just did the hourglass uh, <laughs> shape again, and now you're now you're burpy. Uh, you've got like bubbles shooting out of your ears. <laughs> you're bringing rubber durst in the bathroom. God rest his freedom. God rest his freedom. Um, in his poor innocent man. She did some illustrating during this time as okay. well, but then in 1947, she had one of those classic Hollywood moments that would give false hope to sad people for decades to come. Oh no! She was waiting for Where, a bus. Exactly. <laughs> What counter was she at? She had just ordered a chocolate malt at Schwab's. Um, so she's waiting at a bus. Uh, in my mind, for some reason, it was in front of the Ambassador Hotel. But like, why would she why still, would still be hanging out? Like, you already won your award. Imagine um, she wins Miss Contour, then has to take the bus home. <laughs> with the sash with on. The sash with on. the hourglass figure <laughs> still on her. Greg, pull up your pants. Um, she was waiting for a bus when William Hawks, who was Howard Hawks' brother, drove by and offered her extra work in a movie. Okay. So William Hawks, brother of Howard Hawks, Hawks, a man Hawks. who kept a catalog of women finds another woman on the street. <laughs> yeah, again, this is like another thing of like, I have no idea what exactly happened, yeah, but this yeah. is the story. This led to the next phase of her career, which was various minor roles in movies as varied sexy female characters. Okay. 
okay. it's just tiny little things. Yeah. She was an extra in an Abbott and Costello movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was an extra in Charlie Chaplin's Limelight, which I oh, just wow. watched recently. Oh, really? Her story took another, this is the other really strange detour in what feels to be like a life full of very strange and odd and tragic detours. In 1949, speaking of hourglass figures and uh, overreacting to them, she married Frank L. Graham, who was the voice of the wolf in the Tex Avery cartoon. You're kidding. She married him. This isn't even the craziest part of the story. She was married to this guy until 1950 when he ran his car in his garage with all the doors and windows closed and also took his own life. Okay. This was at 9115 Wonderland Avenue, just down the street from where the Wonderland murders would happen. He left a note saying to Mildred, I leave nothing except the pleasure she will have knowing that now she won't have to decide whether I am good enough for her or not. Wow. P.S. Gee, I wish Mildred had called me back yesterday. Okay, okay. Yesterday morning. Cruel to leave a note like that. Horrible. Horrible to leave that burden on her as well. It's awful. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the relationship was like. But you also just told me that the guy who does the voice for the Tex Avery wolf killed himself, which yeah. I did not know. Uh, yep. And I also did not know that somebody did the voice for the wolf, which I guess I was like, oh, does he have lines? Yeah, he probably has lines. He says a few things. He says a few things. They're ne- none, nothing appropriate. <laughs> so there's just waves of shock happening in my yeah, brain right and now. Also it was, it was like a block away from the one, the four the, on the floor yeah. Wonderland murders. Jesus Christ. Okay. And and this lady was. We haven't even got to the movie yet. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't what she's famous for. So this was oh, a cruel my. ending to what sounds like a very cruel relationship very with a man known for yelling a wooga when he saw <laughs> Little Red Riding Hood. Yeah, that, that was insane. Yeah. That same year, (laughs) she apparently also married a man named Lee Trent, who I believe died of cancer. But the next two men who loomed large in her life were the two she's most remembered for now. One of them had gills and one of them was a universal monster. Both descriptions can apply to both the men I'm talking about. In 1952, she was an extra on the set of The World at His Arms on the Universal lot. And to pass the time, she would always do portraits of her co-stars on the set. Uh, But on this particular day, her portraits got the attention of a big name on the Universal lot. Bud Westmore. Boo. <laughs> Bud. 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 Westmore. Oh, sorry. The mixer went off to dumb again. <laughs> it shuts off for five minutes whenever we're too dumb. <laughs> We've got put in timeout, <laughs> audio timeout. If we did dimes if we wanted to be, <laughs> start working again. It's like Ray Bradbury typing <laughs> at the center. At the <laughs> <library. Bernie> 451. <laughs> this is a dumb sentence. We're shutting down for a couple minutes. Ah, <laughs> not damn it. I'm going to go watch Chernabog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so mad I can watch Turnabog. Bud Westmore is someone who should have his own segment, uh, but he was going to be in this episode, but there was too much already in here. He'll be in another episode, but just to give a brief rundown, he came from a long line of Westmores. Yeah. Who's long line? Westmore's not good. Uh, I disagree. <laughs> um, who started with George Westmore, who in many ways invented the whole concept of movie makeup in the 19 teens. Give the Westmore's credit, Greg. Oh my God. I can think you of a man it. with thousands. Bill Cosby revolutionized the family <laughs> sitcom, Greg. You can't take that away. Uh, I can think of a man with a thousand faces who would disagree about <laughs> starting movie makeup, but okay, whatever. But like, not just like making yourself look like the Phantom of the Opera. Right, right, right. Not right. everyone wanted to look. If it was up to Lon Cheney, everyone would look like the Phantom of the Opera. No, if it was up to Lon Cheney, only he would and nobody <laughs> else would look like the Phantom. Not even his son. He was so... Not even his... Okay. So, Westmore's kids went on to refine and build on his work and went on to run their own hair and makeup departments mm-hmm. in, I think, all of the major movie studios. Yeah. Like, there was a Westmore, I think, in every single one of them, while also being incredibly cutthroat and competitive, not just to everyone else in Los Angeles, but everyone else in their family. The whole family was like, they would murder their own siblings like to get ahead in in show business. The family did make up for everyone from Rudolph Valentino to Patrick Stewart on Star Trek Next Generation, who I've always felt was our generation's Rudolph Valentino. (laughs) Uh, they're like still around the Westmores. Right. They they will always be here. Mm-hmm. And Bud Westmore was a primo example of his family. Like he he could have been on the, the Westmore coat of arms, right. which would just be like one person shoving another one out of the way for a job right, interview. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, extremely talented and influential in his field, Bud Westmore, and also vicious. Mm-hmm. His era began in the 40s and 50s and onward movies of Universal and now young Millicent Patrick came onto his radar. He liked her art 
art and they seem to have maybe worked together on something before this that they met on the set as well. So he hired her right then and there as a designer in his workshop, making her the first woman to work not only in the Universal Special Effects Makeup Department, but also the first woman to work in any movie studio special effects makeup department. Like I'm like, I'm happy for her. I know what comes next, but also (laughs) with the Westmore's and Bud Westmore, it sounds like I went to go do my dream job in a minefield. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's a chair in the middle of a field and there's just bombs everywhere. I'm the first person to walk onto this lion preservation. (laughs) He dream job. I love lions. Uh, He put her to work right away where she designed the Dr. Hyde mask in the movie title with too many people's names in it. Abbott and Costello meet Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Well, there's one for each one. (laughs) I've never seen Abbott and Costello in the same room together. You know what? When Abbott's Maddie turns into Costello, right? (laughs) Nobody talks about that. Nobody's watched the entire who's on first thing, but once they get like four minutes into it, the bloodshed. (laughs) Bruce Banner and the Hulk versus Abbott and Costello meet Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Hyde. Meet Brad Pitt and Ed Norton from Fight Club. Don't spoil it. I spoiled it for myself who's never even seen it. (laughs) And also she did the eyeball alien thing and it came from outer space. Oh, really? She designed it? She designed that. Okay. Uh, That was her eyeball. You know that? Miss Contour's eyeball? (laughs) It was a whole different contour. Uh, But then came the big one around Mm -hmm. 1953 to 54, featuring the other man I was talking about that she'd become inextricably linked from for all time, even though for a while she wasn't. Yeah. The Gill Man. The Gill Man. The The aforementioned creature. She was working in the makeup department when Universal was making the now classic creature from the Black Lagoon, where the Budweiser frogs live, um, featuring the last of the great universal monsters, Mm -hmm. the Gill Man. Uh, We talked more about this movie in depth if you want to go in the monsters and the nerds to love them episode. But when she got involved with the movie, the designs they had for the monster was basically just a guy in a spandex suit, (laughs) which Millicent would not stand for. She redesigned the look completely to be a more articulated, thicker suit covered in scales based on the look of ancient sea animals. Mm -hmm. She also redid the face to make it more human so that we, the viewer, could see the heartbreak on his yeah. face in the movie when the girl is grossed out by him or whatever happens yeah. in the movie. My favorite design. Of the monster of the movies? Monsters. Of, of oh. the monster designs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. the other ones are basically just like a guy with a face. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a guy yeah, with a new face. And they're great faces, but the <laughs> yeah. Gill Man is a fool. It's a whole thing. It's a thing. It's a whole fetish, that thing. <laughs> then the, when the movie was out in theaters, Universal decided to have a sort of press tour to drum up ticket sales, but they didn't want to send a guy in a fish suit all over the country. Right. So instead, they decided to send just the suit itself and someone with it to explain it to people and who better to do that than the woman who designed it herself. Right. Millicent was pretty and mm-hmm. she could obviously speak fluently on the process yeah. of how they made the monster and they came up with a gimmicky title that they could not back down from, The Beauty Who Created the Beast. So that was the name of the tour, which drove Bud Westmore through the roof. Oh, I bet. He flipped out at the- Don't I- you mean the Bud and the Beast? <laughs> Idiot. He flipped out at the idea of Millicent a woman going on <laughs> tour. Millicent's a woman? Uh, surprise. <laughs> the Millicent was a woman. Going on tour and taking credit for a monster design for a movie that wasn't even iconic yet, mind you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. she had That's made. so funny. His feeling was that whatever was made in his shop was his credit to claim, which was just the way it was. And I'm sure still is. Uh-huh. Which is unfair, but it's also pretty hard for any one person to take credit in an art department because right. while Millicent made the Gill Man design what it is, it was still a refinement on a previous design someone else had done however bad that might have been so there really is no eye in an art department unless you're designing the giant eyeball we were just talking about (laughs) the comparison I read was like how we say Stan Lee made all these superheroes when in reality it was all these other people say his name Uh, no Jack Kirby Uh, say his name Millicent (laughs) Patrick it was a few different people including Stan Lee but under the brand name of Marvel yes of of Stan Lee like not even just Marvel 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 you like Marvel movies right beyond just Marvel it's like Stan Lee he did yeah. this, did this. When There's reality, a whole episode of Mad Men where Peggy wants credit. And he's like, that's what the money's for. Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> what the money's a, for, yeah, baby. What, <laughs> you didn't even say thank you. That's, that's what the money's for. Peggy, take the money. Peggy. That's what the money's for, baby. <laughs> There's no document that exists saying Millicent Patrick created the Gill Man, right. but pretty much everyone who worked on the movie, except Bud Westmore, all said Millicent Patrick created the Gill Man. So right. while it's fair to say she shouldn't go around on a national tour saying, I invented the Gill Man alone because right. a lot of people helped, it's also not fair to say she shouldn't go around on a national tour saying, I invented the Gill Man because it was actually me who invented the yeah. Gill Man. Like, it, you can't argue that if you're Bud Westmore. True. But 
Bud Westmore did just that, and he pulled a fit until he got Universal to change the name of the tour to The Beauty Who Lives With The Beast. Oh my god, that's perverse. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. What do you live with the outfit? Or I live with the design <laughs> pinned to my wall? You stupid Bud Westmore. <laughs> I live up on Haunted Hill with <laughs> Frankenstein. I got an Airbnb up there with a creature. There's someone that plays the organs in the... <laughs> <laughs> it's a ghost or a guy who comes late. I don't know. I, I'm never really up that late. So, Universal sent her around, and not just with the Gilman, but with all the other Universal monster movie okay. masks as well. Right. And on top of that, she was forbidden to claim that she had designed the Gilman. And there are actual documents of Bud Westmore's behavior in this situation mm-hmm. existing. There are memos about it from yeah. Universal. One of them said, I think we all agree that Westmore is being a little childish over the entire matter. <laughs> Even one of Bud Westmore's brothers said that he was being ridiculous. Hey, when you get your brother to admit you, you're a, a yeah, piece you're of You're the work. worst of the family. You're the worst in the family. You're a worse than the family of worsts. You are the, I'm trying to think of like a really bad family. Of the Trumps, you're Donald for sure. In my head, I was thinking of like, what's that Roman family where they all were in power and they were all kind of crazy. And yeah, they were the Trumps. They were That's the what Trumps. I was thinking of. So this is like the great controversy right. of Millicent Patrick, right. which is, uh, you know, sick. It's it's very sad. It's very sad. Uh, I said sick. I didn't say sad. Oh, uh, that's right. It's not sad at all. Um, nevertheless, Millicent embarked on her month-long tour in January 1954, just her and a bunch of molds of Bella Lugosi's head going around the country. She did over 40 interviews on radio and print and on TV. She was on the Today Show talking about how monster design and makeup was done, and she became a star because she was beautiful and she was well-dressed and people just liked her. Yeah. And this, of course, made Bud Westmore furious. And when Bud Westmore was furious or jealous of you, he would either fire you or he would make your job so miserable that you would not be able to take it and you would quit. Right. Uh, he chose the second path for Millicent when she got back from her tour. She was ignored. She was cut out. Her designs weren't given as much respect. She managed to hang in there for about another year, but once she finished work on the movie Captain Lightfoot, she either quit or was fired. Again, it's not really clear, but the design she left behind went on to either be used directly or be modified for the mole people and the Metaluna mutant in this island Earth, But sadly, that was really it for her. Like, it's believed that Bud Westmore made sure she didn't get work in any of the makeup departments in any other studios. But also, she was 40 now in a time when 40-year-olds didn't get modeling work, so she couldn't go back to that. And also, she didn't really seem that interested in doing behind-the-scenes thing. Like, she got Mm -hmm. a taste for fame. Like, she's not going back to the ink and paint department. Uh, She had some small acting roles into the 60s and ended up being in 21 movies and dozens of TV shows and various small roles, but her career kind of fizzled out. But when Bud Westmore died in 1973, you can bet your sweet little fish butt that she was starting privately taking credit for having designed the Gill Man. Uh, she died in Roseville on February 24th, 1998. But between then and the 70s, nothing is really known about her. Like, all I can find is that on and off, she dated George Tobias, who was the husband of the lady across the street on Bewitched, who <laughs> always saw weird stuff happening. And right. her husband was like, you're crazy. Oh she dated that guy. Yeah, my response to that is, you're crazy. Crazy. You, you're imagining that. I swear, Greg. I, I saw them. You gotta come I over. I saw them at Nobu. I'm over here and he's not married to her. <laughs> I saw, uh, what's the place that John Mulaney and Olivia Munn? I saw them at Rick's. I saw them at Rick's I, saw, I swear. Don't get started on me. And to be honest, not a lot is really known. Like I said, not a lot is really known about any part of her life, really. Yeah. She created a lot of mythos around herself mm-hmm. and parts of her legacy were purposely covered up by right. Bud Westmore. It's not even universally agreed on when she was born or when she died. Like she's listed by the Screen Actors Guild as among the missing, which I don't <laughs> even know what that means. Like, did she not come home from Vietnam? Like, <laughs> Why do they have a among the missing That's for the weird. Screen Actors Guild? Very weird. It seems like nobody seems to really know when she died died or dare I say if yes. she died. Oh. So I say drain that swamp and let's see if she's <laughs> swimming around in there so we can capture her for three movies where we put her in a suit in the last one. Put her in a suit and make her get a job. Have you seen the the last? No, I haven't. You told me and yeah. you sent me a text, I think maybe with a picture of the gill man in a suit. And yeah. you're like, check this out. <laughs> Look what they did to him now. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, the worst yeah. injustice he's yeah. ever gone through. He works on Wall Street, <laughs> which is a lo- Black Lagoon of another <laughs> kind. So yeah, that's Millicent Patrick. Wow. Uh, yeah, and there's that book, uh, The Lady from 
the Black Lagoon. I believe that's what it's called. By it's a it's a name that's kind of like hers, Mallory O'Meara. Mallory O'Meara, I think she was she was a guest on um, Dana Gould's podcast and they talked about it, which is I knew that there you know there's photos of this beautiful woman holding the mask the, the, yeah. and like petting it. I'm like, what's this? <laughs> and I was like obsessed with those photos for a while. So I, you know I learned about her, but his podcast in this segment, I we got the full picture now. Yeah, the, yeah. You don't have to read the book anymore. You got it now. <laughs> she Between, didn't know anything. I don't know anything. We're all good. Between hearing an interview with the author and hearing me who did a month's worth of research on it. You got it. You got it. <laughs> so who who have you got for me, Greg? Okay. Is that thunder or wobbly sheet metal? Has man gone too far? Is he plain God? It's wobbly sheet metal. We're going to be talking about a little man from Greece, not the movie, named Giannis Piccola, or he's known in the, in the small Hollywood circle that worships him, Jack Pierce. Really? That's like the most American name I can think of. Jack Pierce? Giannis Piccola. Uh, Giannis Piccola, yeah. So he's from, or is he from Greece? He's, from, he's from Greece. Really? Yeah, and he moved to the States. Yeah, we were talking about before this, he looks like all American. I didn't say all American. I said he looks like someone who says whippersnapper a lot. To me, that's all American. <laughs> when I think of George Washington, I think the guy says whippersnapper a lot. <laughs> Jack Pierce was the head of the makeup department for Universal Studios during the monster heyday, an era of makeup perfection that has never been as iconic as it was when Pierce was in charge. Iconic as in recognizable iconography. Like Frankenstein's creature from Mary Shelley's novel is nothing like what we see in the 1931 Frankenstein, but every iteration of Frankenstein since then for almost 100 years now has been yeah. branched off from that original one. Our Same under- with Dracula. Same with Dracula. Our understanding of the looks of werewolves, mummies, and European vampire counts all revolve around Jack Pierce's work, if not directly channeling his looks, then actively avoiding it, but being aware <laughs> yeah. of it. Like, we're going to do a, a vampire, but it's not going to be like yeah. like Dracula. So, like, even if you are using that template, yeah. you're avoiding the template, gonna you're still like aware of it. It's going to look like that guy from Harry Potter. <laughs> you know, uh, Ron Weasley. Okay. <laughs> So let's talk about Jack Pierce. Jack Pierce was born in Greece in May of 1889, which is one of those magical oh years God. before the internet that sound fantastic. One of those magical years before antibiotics <laughs> that I just love to go back to. Where soap was a new thing. <laughs> um, the Piccolas immigrated to the United States when Giannis was in his teens and they landed in Chicago. But Jack was vying for life as a professional baseball player in Chicago, <laughs> but unfortunately for the Baseball Hall of Fame, that did not come to pass. But looking at him in the little footage that there is of him and even pictures that you get a sense of this scrappy little baseball player of the early 20th century. Like if I look at pictures of him, I'm like, yeah, he would have played baseball. You're chewing tobacco. You have a hat you throw on the ground. He looks like- He says whippersnapper. He says whippersnapper. That's the name of his team. He looks like somebody in Looney Tunes that would fight Bugs Bunny. I can see like brawny forearms. Fedora covering his eyes. Yeah. Yeah. He's got like a toothpick sticking Mm -hmm. out and up. Out and up. And to the left. It's easier to draw that way. He pursued a life in athletics for some time and that career path led to Los Angeles. But once he was here trying to get onto the California Coast League team, it was officially stated Jack Pierce you are too short to play major league baseball (laughs) even though in chicago he was a semi-pro shortstop that five foot six janice was simply brushed aside because of his size and that was i'm sure devastating so baseball didn't work out and now Giannis is a regular old felon here in los angeles and what's what's there to do here chump so around this time he meets his wife blanche craven which itself is like a monster name that's the name of a woman who great great grandmother of west (laughs) i look i'm like is that really how many cravens could there be and then he decides once he's married to blanche craven decides to change his name from Giannis Piccola to jack pierce officially which his family hates him for why to be more American, I guess. But, I guess he was trying to find jobs and trying to find a job with a... But if you're like, I'm Giannis, they're like, no, 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 no. It's 19 whatever right now. No thanks. So did his wife become a Pierce? No, I think uh, everything I see with her, it's Blanche Craven. She didn't lose the Craven. She was into the Craven. Yeah, why didn't he take the Craven? Though? I would have taken Jack Craven. Oh, take the, oh, hire that guy. That's almost like Raven. Jack <laughs> oh, Craven. Yeah, Jack K. I'm Jack Raven. Raven. Yeah, Jack. And I'm here to do monster makeup. Oh yeah, then you're hired. Oh, you absolutely <laughs> hired. We're going to get rid of the last guy, Teddy Sheep. We're going to get rid of him because Craven's spookier. So he's not playing baseball. He's married. He changed his name to a more American name. Uh, and he starts finding work in a new avenue in its infancy, the entertainment industry of Southern California. First, he starts on the outside working as a theater projectionist. And then he started managing a theater chain I also read he was a Nickelodeon manager. It's probably the same thing. Before sneaking into this. I say sneak, but he probably worked really hard and had direction. So yeah, he started working for studios after that. He worked as a camera loader, a stuntman, assistant director, and a bit player in some acting roles between 1915 to around 1928. He's a stuntman? Yeah, but I, don't, I couldn't find... The, 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 it's very vague about what movies he was doing what for. But I feel like in those days, which was like the late teens, you just kind of yeah. did... Everything was like an independent movie, yeah. it felt like. Yeah. So you're just like, can you do... It's like everything's yeah. a corporate can movie. You, uh, we, 
we want to drop this house on Buster Keaton again, but <laughs> it, it might kill him this time. So uh, you're Greek. Can you go? Yeah. <laughs> you're a good standing for Buster Keaton. Yeah, you're short. You can, you're short. You're, you're short. short. You look like you couldn't make it in professional baseball. Just like Buster Keaton. Get in there. Get in there. If a train hits you, it probably won't hurt much because you're <laughs> short, I guess. According to IMDb, he played Bald. Okay, this is names or so of that era. He played Baldy Joe and Misguided. <laughs> Kill Patrick in One Dollar's Worth. Uh, Chug Wilson and the Fighting Doctor. Black Pete in The Man Who Waited. And Pedro in Law and Order because every actor throughout time has to be in a law and order. <laughs> That's how you know you've made it. <laughs> Those were just some of his roles. Now, he here's the thing about his acting roles. The studio system back then, as lavish as it was, was also in its infancy and kind of like a mom and pop shop in a lot of ways. I don't know how true it is in this regard, but at the time, Pierce saw a way to get more regular work and it was by doing his own makeup. If he did that, he could put himself into any role like, that, Lon, Chaney. like Lon Chaney if they needed a, this thing. Oh, I could do the makeup and I could put it myself and you don't have to worry and I'm right. ready for that already. Yeah. So that was his way to get more regular work. He knew he was not going to be a big movie star because uh, he wasn't big. He wasn't even. There's no uh, big movie stars, just short actors. <laughs> that's this. That's the saying. That's the saying back then. You know, a set of bears not going to be hot in the drawers for this little guy. But he knew that he can get roles doing yeah. his own makeup. Who's ever heard of a short leading man? Tom Cruise. Yeah. Charles Manson. <laughs> Who's ever- Napoleon. No. <laughs> but he knew he can get roles doing his own makeup. So through his acting career in the 20s, Pierce would do his own makeup, which is why he was getting cast more. And he was getting good at it. From what I could tell, he did his own makeup for The Man Who Waited, Desert Rider, The Speed Demon, and Masquerade, a film from 1929. And he had two people there to inspire him. Jack Dawn, the man who would go on to do makeup for The Wizard of Oz, which was like a big deal at the time. The other person that helped inspire him was the man of a thousand faces in the middle of his heyday, Lon Chaney, who I believe was the, I believe he was the head of the makeup department at Universal at the time. Was he? Yeah, oh, he was, just- because he did The Hunchback, Phantom of the Opera, and another big that, that I mean, it's not like he was doing makeup for other people. Yeah, movies. yeah. Oh, I th- I they, he was the makeup department because he was the only, the only one, one doing the makeup. <laughs> yeah. Everyone else just had like a sh- different shirt on. Universal had not become the house of horror built yet. Uh, it was still making shorts through the 1910s and it was very much, still very much a studio at the baby level. Even though part of the valley was called Universal City, it was still like <laughs> building up. And just to remind everyone, the head of the studio and the founder was Carl Lemley. Just to put that out there because we're going to get to it later. Anyways, while out getting small acting roles, Jack Pierce had begun developing his own makeup skills, learning tricks and tips, and having enough room and know-how to experiment through the 20s. Through Lon Chaney's heyday, Jack Pierce was sort of in the background learning on his own. He started working with Lasky's famous players, then for Vitagraph, as well as the original Fox Studios throughout the 20s. This is what he was doing. His first established big deal makeup job came in 1927, Monkey Talks. Here's a synopsis for that movie. It sounds amazing. A bankrupt circus act plans to revive its fortune by disguising a diminutive acrobat as a talking chimpanzee. When the acrobat falls in love with a beautiful tightrope walker, things go awry. That was a movie from 1927. Um, and I feel like it could be made in 2021. I, I, think it would, I think the world is ready for a remake. Uh, a, a 24 movie. Now, the actor Jacques Lanier was a star and the director, Wal Walsh, who went on to, he had directed Thief of Baghdad, went on to direct White Heat and Roaring Twenties. He wasn't satisfied with the monkey makeup for Lanier. So Jack Pierce stepped up and did the makeup work and it is astounding. It's really ahead of its time like Planet of the Apes level good. I've seen some angles like that kind of looks bad, but there's a couple shots like that looks like a a chimp man. (laughs) It's a chimp in a suit. That's not a real chimp. So next up for Pierce, he creates one of the most iconic and truly, I say this truly terrifying makeup jobs on Conrad Viet for the Viet. Is it Viet? I've always heard Conrad Veit. Is it um, Voight? No, not Voight, not John Voight. It's Conrad Veit. Veit. Okay, we'll say Veit. Conrad Veit. Well, now that we're saying it too much, I feel like I've lost it. I thought it was Conrad Conrad Veit. I don't know how to pronounce German names. Oh, how American you are. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, (laughs) Hitler. I don't know. (laughs) I'm sorry we didn't all fight for the Allies during World War II. (laughs) Henry Himmler, who's that? (laughs) Henry. Um, Hank Himmler. (laughs) (laughs) Jack Pierce is responsible for the makeup job on one of the most scary makeup jobs I've ever seen, The Man Who Laughs in 1928. I thought you were, first of all, I thought you were going to say The Invisible Man. And I was like, yeah, that is quite a makeup job. (laughs) Yeah, that's a lot of bandages that guy has on. I love when he throws a nose. Anyways, he does the makeup for The Man Who Laughs, which is- uh, Which one is that? Is that- uh, Big Smile. Right. Uh, look the at Joker. You, the, the Joker. Exactly. Uh, I'll, I'm going to mention that in a couple sentences, so give me a minute. I'll cut that out. Let me change that. Uh, the Two-Face one. <laughs> look it up if you haven't seen it. It's startling, especially like there's a photo of Jack Pierce when he's putting like a big powdered wig on him and he's got the <laughs> face. You're like, oh God. For that, he sculpted the grin that went on that Vite wears. Uh, if you're wondering- oh, yet. <laughs> 
If you're wondering how iconic this makeup job is, Conrad Veidt's look in The Man Who Laughs is said to be the direct inspiration for the Joker. That's how iconic this thing is, is that it's stamped into one of the biggest villains of the 20th yeah. century. Yeah, and there, wasn't there even a Batman comic called The Man, the man Who, who Laughs? laughs. Yeah, I believe there's a man who laughs. Yeah. What about uh, the one who knocks? Isn't that the Joker? That's the Joker when he's selling meth to <laughs> high schoolers. I've only seen parts of that show. <laughs> Jack Pierce did what was referred to as extreme makeup methods, which were impressive. So impressive that they caught the eye of Carl Lemley. So now two things happen. The first is the next year, 1928, Lon Chaney left the makeup department of Universal to go pursue his own independent career. And when I read that, I was like, wow, Lon Chaney is about to go become Lon Chaney. <laughs> nope. He died two years later, his best work being done in the 20s, which were behind him, with Fan of the Opera, the other one. God, I can't believe I forgot. London After Midnight, mm -hmm. the makeup job that Lon Chaney does. It's great. We don't know because there's only like five photos that yeah, exist. Yeah, I've in seen movie. the recreated version uh, Turner Classic Movie does where it's just a bunch of still photos <laughs> that they string together Spooky. with music. Yeah. <laughs> kind of shake them around. No. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think he's saying here? We wouldn't know because it was silent and also we don't have the footage. <laughs> so not only was there an opening for the makeup department at Universal, there's also an opening in the entertainment industry for the next evolution of makeup work. Mm -hmm. At Chaney's departure from uh, Universal, the still impressed Carl Lemley hired Jack Pierce to be the new head of of the makeup department where he would start at the dying days of silent film. The second thing that happened was in 1929, anybody who heard the other episode probably knows this, but I'll reiterate, Carl Lemley- People would, don't listen to our old episodes. They don't care. You know how old those are? They're seven years old. Um, <laughs> they're, those were silent. Those were our silent, <laughs> silent podcasts. Uh, Carl Lemley would give his son, Carl Lemley Jr., affectionately and derogatorily referred to as Junior, this 21st- Le They called him Carl Lemley Lesser. <laughs> Diet Carl Lemley. <laughs> For his 21st birthday, he got uh, a junior job as the chief of production at Universal Studios and Junior wanted to make horror movies. He was a big genre fan, not explicitly, but based on the projects he moved forward with, he had a taste for horror and now he had the perfect person in the makeup department to bring those horror projects to alive. Um, it, it, he's alive. Um, it's alive. <laughs> the department's the alive. The department's alive. <laughs> so we're about to enter not only Jack Pierce's heyday lasting from 1930 to 1947, we're about to enter the era of Universal Monsters. So as stated, Cheney changed the game and made huge successes with his work on The Hunchback of Notre Dame and The Phantom of the Opera, London After Midnight. So it was clear that people liked horror movies. Junior wanted to push the genre further and sought to produce films based on classic horror novels. He would start with Dracula and Frankenstein, 1930, 1931. We won't spend too much time talking about- Written by a woman. Well, one of them. You mean, uh, was it a woman who invented horror? Yeah. <laughs> I always wondered if it was true, but they always said that she carried um, Percy Shelley's heart in the bag. Was it Percy Shelley? Whoever her husband was, she carried his heart in the bag. I don't, I don't know, know why you true. doubt that being true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we won't spend too much time talking about Jack Pierce's work on Dracula because Bela Lugosi, star of Dracula, refused to let Jack Pierce do any work on him. I guess Lugosi, who was theater trained, liked to do his own makeup. But Pierce, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Pierce's main contribution to Dracula's look was his- He liked to do a lot of stuff. Behind a curtain- while Paul Marco watched drugs. Um, um, <laughs> blood. We're talking blood. We're talking blood here. Pierce's main contribution, like I just said, was Dra to Dracula's look was his widow's peak. I'm generally curious to hear if- uh, that, that was his big innovation yeah. in makeup. He's balding. He's, uh, he got bitten when he was losing his hair and now he's stuck in that <laughs> pathetic look yeah. forever. He got bit by a vampire bat and then he got bitten by a bald-headed <laughs> bat. He got bit by male pattern baldness. I'm generally curious if- to see what his ideas for Dracula would have been. If they were similar, if he helped design the look, or if he was going to make it more like a Nosferatu. We'll never know. We'll never know. But he, he said he helped a lot with the styling of Dracula as well as the Brides of Dracula. I also read somewhere that he designed a special grease paint for Lugosi. So yes, technically he works on Dracula, the first of the iconic Universal Monster movies. Also, the two famously did not get along. Well, That's fine. What's both... grease paint again exactly? I, think I always hear it. What is it? I, you know, I don't really know. It's the kind of, I guess the paint that light doesn't bounce off is that it right like I it's know. when i think of grease paint i think of what Groucho used to draw on his mustache. Right. But that can't be, that just looks like grease. Yeah. It must just be like a, I have no idea. I thought I knew when I read down and now that you asked me, I'm like, I have no idea. Uh, but in my opinion, his best work was right on the corner with Universal's other father figure, Frankenstein's creature, played by the lovable and soothing Boris Karloff, who was pretty much an unknown at that time and treated as very disposable. It's important to note that Karloff knew that the role would, let's start off before we talk about what he went through. He was very up for this. He went over with Pierce how awful the makeup process would be. And he was like, 
I don't have other jobs. Let's just do it. They got Karloff based on, I think, the criminal code. And he's just like kind of like a lanky guy. But he, at the time, very skinny, very like overpowering. So like, you're going to be Frankenstein. Legend is Howard Hawk saw him at a bus stop. No, <laughs> Howard Hawk saw him at a commissary. At just a His lot. brother saw him at a bus stop. Yeah, <laughs> this is another one of those stories. It like is. They'll see you eating lunch and they're going to make you a monster. <laughs> you scare me. You ready to scare America? <laughs> I like the way you devoured that uh, ham sandwich. <laughs> so I heard it was Pierce along with Karloff that would meet up at night night before they began shooting and talk about different looks and test things on Karloff early on before shooting. Pierce was in also incredibly deep detailed and poured over anatomy books, uh, electronic books, criminology books. He even found what he determined was a criminal look based on criminology books and moved forward with that idea, which sounds like profiling, but we'll get over it. <laughs> Pierce used uh, something called collodion. That's according to the internet, when painted on the skin, collodion dries to form a flexible nitrocellulose film. So it's like liquid plastic that is 24% ether. So it uh, was incredibly flammable. Then there was uh, like cotton as a base, like cotton rolls for the head, cotton for different parts of the body, then collodion blended into the skin. The only prosthetic used was the flat part of the creature's head done to imply that Dr. Frankenstein, not being a trained surgeon, would remove the top of the skull, replace the brain, then reattach very sloppily. <laughs> like carving like, a pumpkin? Like carving a pumpkin. <laughs> like putting the lid on a box, which is why it's square. That's what the square is. In case head. I need to unpack this uh -huh. again. In case I have to move the brain around, I don't want it to be hard to unstitch that. So because there were no prosthetics, the makeup would have to be redone every day. Mm. You get rid of what you did one day mm -hmm. and then it adhered to the skin so taking it off would, was worse it pulled at you <laughs> Karloff reportedly <laughs> slept in the makeup some nights. The electrode bolts on Frankenstein's neck were applied using spirit gum, which I hear is really strong. And apparently Karloff had scars of where the electrodes were on his neck. I'm starting the, to think he was Frankenstein. After this, I think he was. I think he was just like whatever was left after that movie. He was just like, I, I don't, I get up at 3.30 in the morning every day now. <laughs> I, I crave yeah. electricity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just want to throw little girls on a lake, but you feel bad for me. Jack Pierce used mortician's wax on the the eyelids to give the eyes a dead look. Hmm. Uh, here's a Karloff trick. So one side of Frankenstein's face is caved in around the cheekbone. Yeah. It has a, a deep indent. Oh, I think I know. It was accomplished by Karloff taking out his false teeth, yeah. his dental bridge, and so one part, like like what, like guy in Skyfall, like Javier Bardem in Skyfall, <laughs> and, exists, yeah. and, and his, his whole face, face just like collapses. You're like, oh my god. Uh, there are also metal braces, uh, like a steel rod, sewn into the back of his jacket that touched his spine, yeah. and then there's a like, quilting around it, and the the pant, the legs of his pants also had these steel rods to stiffen the walk of the creature. Another Pierce idea, as was putting lifts in the boots to make him look taller, <laughs> uh, so he could go, so he could disco really well, so he could play shortstop. Yeah, that was Jack Pierce's dream. He, every single character. How about we make lift your, taller. we put you lifts. In <laughs> the thing I cannot do now that I have full control of the makeup department, <laughs> I can create my deepest fantasies. People with big shoes, <laughs> people with big cleats, playing for the Chicago Cubs. All of this took five hours to apply and their day started at 3 30 in the morning Oof. then karloff would go off to a, work a grueling 16 hour day Oof. in hot heavy prosthetics and wardrobe okay so he has three hours to sleep every night he has three hours to get home and sleep every night but don't forget the makeup also has to come off oh my god so it was about i would say it was about three hours rip of it sleep. off the end of summer so it's hot <laughs> in the San Fernando valley wearing prosthetics and heavy quilting and then he has to lift the little girl and Colin Clive and climb Colin Clive up a fake hill over and over and over <laughs> while for there's whale. a lot of fire around while him. there's a lot of fire around him it was a really bad he pretty much created the film actors union after this <laughs> just so he's like I can only do 12 hours a day I am not an animal that's a different movie that's but, a different, still. but still it's a, the same role applies I belong in a union <laughs> also Carl Limley reportedly was so appalled at the hideousness of the makeup job that he wanted Karloff escorted through the studio with a veil over his head and Jack Pierce would have to hold the creature's hand and walk him to set. <laughs> That's so sweet. It's so cute. After Frank That's how I got to school. <laughs> Jack Pierce would hold my hand with a veil over my head. Keep the bag over. He'll frighten the other children. Uh, he'll, he'll frighten the little rascals. <laughs> After Frankenstein, Pierce was the star on the Universal lot. Nowhere else. Next up, Pierce and Karloff came the mummy. Another fantastic makeup job yeah. for the aged look of Imhotep when he first awakens. So that's a majority of the work they did what that if, was grueling uh, was the beginning. I've got a new character, Emotep. It's a mummy who's in Green Day. Save it for the sketch show. 
Thanks. I'll write that down before you forget. Oh, I got one more intro in I me go. though. <laughs> this will be the last <laughs> intro ever. Yeah, for the age look of Emotep when he first wakes up, because that's like a majority of the work they put into was when Mommy first comes alive. It was another grueling task, another eight hour day under the brush of Jack Pierce. It was another collagen and cotton job with more spirit gum and linen bandages that had to be cooked so they looked aged and burnt and fragile. And then dirt and other effects were applied to that. Pierce, this was Jack Pierce's favorite thing he ever did. This was the best, his best work. Karloff said it was the most trying ordeal he ever endured. When in the wrapping, he had to be wheeled around the set <laughs> and he was quoted as saying to Jack, well, you've done a wonderful job, but you've forgotten to give me a fly. Silly guy, silly goose. And you gave me a scarab instead. <laughs> These are, we're also planning to make a series of popsicle stick <laughs> jokes. And that's one of them. Allie Meekly popsicles. Yeah. What, what is a mummy unzip to go to the bathroom? bathroom. A scarab. So, <laughs> To let his little pharaoh out. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter how grueling this was because the images of Frankenstein and the mummy were so astounding for its day that they were becoming instantly recognizable and they became the go-to for those creatures. If you're going to draw a mummy, it looks like the universal mummy that Jack Pierce made. Yeah. It's going to be Frankenstein. It looks like the Frankenstein that Jack Pierce made. He went on to do more Karloff makeup for Old Dark House and The Black Cat, both starkly different looks for two fantastic films for their era. He also did makeup for The Werewolf of London, which is one of my favorite makeup up looks because I love it when werewolves wear clothes. Um, Ooh, he was working that late? Werewolf Jack, of London? Wait, what am I thinking of? Oh, I'm thinking of an American werewolf. You are thinking London. of an American werewolf in London, which is, I, I believe, Rick Baker, which is yeah. uh, so, next year's Halloween yeah. person. <laughs> next year, the 80s. <laughs> so he does Werewolf of London, 1935. But the actor didn't want to go through the grueling makeup routine, refused to, and he wanted his face to show. So Pierce had to work around those things. I don't know if that frustrated him, but later we'll see Pierce's full idea for a werewolf come to fruition. <laughs> then comes what many people, including myself, think is the best of the Universal Monster movies, The Bride of Frank. Frankenstein. I thought you said, oh, you said the, the creature, creature is my is favorite monster favorite design. Creature. The movies. I, I hey, That's fair. I like the gay one. Uh, Bride of Frankenstein is the gayest of the Universal Monster movies. Is it because of the homunculuses? It's the ballerina, the small ballerina under a, a glass. And I think this isn't for the general population, is it? This is for a special crowd. Uh, I forgot where I read that. Oh, there's like a book I have on horror movies and it has like a like, you know description synopsis and then like uh, How gay is like, it? <laughs> how gay is it? How gay is this movie? This Mother is your Jones. Mother Jones movie guy that you're reading yeah. uh, synopsis how scary is it how gay is it okay is it oh uh, i won't be watching this one <laughs> it's by birdcage i don't think i'll be watching this one <laughs> yeah but i read this commentary on bride franks and the whole thing is like oh well there's all the the homosexual implications because of james whale i'm like oh, oh yeah. that's what oh <laughs> dr oh. frankenstein dr frankenstein can't seem to get married <laughs> I hate Colin Clive. I just want to put, and for that matter, all the like white normal men of monster movies that are so forgettable are so boring. I mean, are they meant to be memorable? I, I, I have no idea. Then why even be there? Because you can't have the monster without the human. The you Hayes can't code. have the beast without the beauty. Yeah, the Hayes Code <laughs> says- you got to be an American man gotta there. Be, you got to have a bland white man. You got a bland movie. white man who loves a woman after knowing her for a half an hour and he's obsessed <laughs> with getting married to her because that's the only way they're going to have sex. So for the bride, who was- by the way, under a technicality, is married to Dr. Frankenstein, not the creature. So technically, she's married to Colin Clive. He took his name. <laughs> uh, we all come to this country with a weird name, and we all become Jack Pierce. We all become <laughs> Frankenstein. We want a good American name, and Frankenstein. Frankenstein, so then we can go by the Baroness and confuse everybody later. That's what we want. That's the American dream. What did Count Orlock? <laughs> Count Orlock. I don't want my Greek name anymore. I want to be known as Count Orlock. I want to blend in to America. <laughs> I have to blend in. I have to carry my coffin around the street during the day. <laughs> even though that's how I die later. It's all for the bride, Elsa Lanchester, the magnificent Elsa Lanchester. The script called for her to look like a mummy, which they're a part of it where she is wrapped up. And that is yeah. also very scary. It's like, what's going on? It's shaped like a va voom but I'm not sure yet. <laughs> is, is this the new Miss Contour competition? <laughs> but for her debut outside of the wrapping, Jack Pierce wanted to go for something completely different. And he went for a look, which I'll, I now I can't stop thinking about. He went for a queen Nefertiti. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, the original yes queen. The <laughs> Yes, queen. Look it up if you don't know. Look up the the bust. Um, but it's the you know it's just Google bust queen of Egypt, and she has a big her her head juts out with a big kind of yeah. not cone, but like the a cylindrical, original Marge Simpson. The original Marge Simpson. That's what he was going for. And now that I know that, I'm like, oh, that's pretty. They also for that they had to put Elsa's hair in a big 
cage, as she said, and then give it the white streaks and right. tease it and everything. Yeah. And that was all done by Jack himself. He also gave her stitches around the lining of her jaw to remind us that she's another meat collage. Um, <laughs> a human casserole. Uh, after Bride of Frankenstein, the Lemley sold off Universal and the next 10 years were going to be bumpy. Uh, but for the creature, as good as the work Pierce did for the monster in Bride of Frankenstein, it was noticeably different than the first film. The Frankenstein's monster from the first one is incredibly terrifying and the next one a little bit beefier. Um, part of it was... <laughs> well, he's married now. Karloff, Karloff was not, no longer... Moon's over. He was no longer a... A sp- full honeymoon. What's that, howling in the distance? <laughs> I'm uh, turning into a matrimony <laughs> wolf. <laughs> <laughs> he got shot with an infidelity bullet. <laughs> So Frankenstein monster looks starkly different from the first one to the second one. A lot of it is that Karloff is no longer a starving actor. <laughs> so he's no longer as skinny and gaunt as he was in the original one. Some people make an argument that through the Frankenstein movies that the, the monster is evolving because if you think about it in Bride of Frankenstein, he's talking Yeah. and the next one, his look continues to well, grow. I mean, once you start getting into the ones where it wasn't, where it was like Bela Lugosi playing, like son of, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's like it's basically just like a guy who has like a, almost like Andy Griffith, but like Harry. formerly dead Andy Griffith. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody put Goober and Gomer together and gave it a brain and that's what we were saying. Gomer is the, the mechanic the, the, was kind of dumb. Goober's We got the best parts of both of them. <laughs> we got the Cary Grant capabilities of Goober. We got the military valor of Gomer <laughs> and the heart of Floyd the Barber. Oh my god. That's who Jack Pierce reminds me of. Yes. Floyd the is. Barber. Yes, he, that is General Whippersnapper himself. <laughs> Floyd the Barber. Floyd the Barber. Yeah. I was looking at a picture like who does he remind me of? He reminds me of Floyd the barber. basically a barber because too. he also wore like he's always kind of holding like a scissor yeah like hey, it, it, it being it's way it's too close oh, okay. it was a good it was a good, it was a good idea yeah. <laughs> did you hear Carl Lemley <laughs> <laughs> but Pierce was finding new techniques to do things more effectively so the creature was looking a lot different so like he'd find shortcuts here and there that weren't necessarily bad but he was just like oh what if I do this and so he's still experimenting with a look also consider at the time I mean he might have plans like notes he made of like yeah. how it's supposed to look but the general public who saw the original Frankenstein like three years earlier yeah, or whatever yeah. with no like the internet was invented well like two years after this but like they couldn't go back and be like wait a minute yeah they yeah, probably yeah. didn't even remember they what he looked like didn't need, they, they probably remember like I think he has stitches in a black suit yeah he looked kind of like the president. <laughs> yeah, you're right. They weren't like ref. There was no reference material. Yeah, there material. was not like, hey, wait a minute. That's not how Jabba the Hutt looked. Yeah, and there was no um, fans forced the people who make Sonic to make Sonic yeah, look more like Sonic. Yeah, they didn't have to change his teeth to make <laughs> make him pull out the bridge again in his mouth. We like that one more. <laughs> this isn't the Frankenstein I grew up with two years ago, which was half of someone's lifetime back then. <laughs> so, like I'm saying, he's finding new techniques. And as time went on, these monster movies were without Pierce, makeup jobs for the creature for Lonchini Jr. and Glenn Strange would be done cheaper and faster. So more prosthetics were used, which looked bad. And they took this iconic look and drove it into the ground. That's bad in that every reproduction is less than the original. So if you ask a kid to draw Frankenstein's monster, you're going to get the things that Jack Pierce came up with, but you lose sight of how shockingly scary the actual makeup job on 1931's Frankenstein is, was what I'm trying to say is like, you're getting like less and less of the original one. So you're getting more iconic, but also kids are seeing the original, like when Frankenstein first emerges from the shadows, you're like, oh, yeah, imagine, I mean, imagine yeah. like the only time you would have seen anything scary was when you saw like a dead body, a, a full dead body <laughs> in the street, which I mean, which was common. It's the depression. <laughs> Anyways, next up for Jack Pierce was the son of Frankenstein. But instead of Karloff getting all the attention for the makeup work, which he w- he was in this one, all of the great makeup work went to old, I don't need your help, Bela Lugosi, <laughs> who Pierce gave a- I got this removable mole no. I can use. <laughs> I'll do it. Get out of here. That's <laughs> but, my impression but. for Lugosi for everything. It's mine. Get out of here. <laughs> he played Igor and he got a great right. makeup job for this one. A lot of people give credit to his work applying- Yak's hair to the beard and blended in. More on that later. But didn't uh, Bella Lugosi also play Frankenstein the monster yeah, late, so, later yeah, in uh, like Abbott and Costello or like like House of Frankenstein or, or something? Ghost like that? of Frankenstein. Or the accountant of Frankenstein. The cold spots of Frankenstein. Um, Frankenstein goes west. The Lord of the Frankenstein. Frankenstein goes Hawaii. <laughs> European Frankenstein. A Christmas Frankenstein. Frankenstein um, European vacation. Frankenstein and the half blood <laughs> eagle. What? A lot of people give credit to, like I was saying, like the yak hair for the beard. But the horror, yak hair won the Oscar that year. Uh, horror makeup artists really lose it over the broken neck bone that Pierce yeah, uses. Yeah, I remember that. It's just blended in like a big piece and you know he taps it Ugh. he's also got Lugosi also wore a contraption sewn into his clothes so he couldn't like it stiffened his movements <laughs> uh, and it was given rotten teeth to wear 
all of this, yeah, this given but all, all of that like the the hunchback the broken neck the teeth all igor that's yeah. what we recognize as igor that spells igor that to spells me. igor <laughs> his love of yak's hair truly paid off in 1941 when he was hired to work on the masterpiece the wolf man mm. uh starring lon Chini jr who karina longworth hates i was listening <laughs> to the bala and uh, boris episodes and i've heard a lot of her podcast and a lot of nefarious characters and even Charles Manson, but no one's gotten her editorial scorn as much as Lon Haney Jr. Gonna, it's don't, so don't funny it. to me. <laughs> it is so funny that she curses. The movie is how I first heard about Jack's work because I knew how insane it was to do the transform- transformation scenes. Right. That's how I first heard about Jack yeah. Pierce. Working on The Wolfman also produced some of the most well-known photos of Jack Pierce. If you're wondering if you're familiar of what he looks like, if you've seen a photo of you've Lon Chaney. Andy Griffith show. If you've seen uh, Floyd the Barber. If have you seen photos of Lon Chino Jr. in Wolfman garb pretending to hold a fist up to the makeup <laughs> artist? That's Jack Pierce. I feel like when Guillermo del Toro did his show at LACMA that there was a... The iconic picture of Jack Pierce I'm thinking of is the one where he's standing over Boris Karloff in the makeup chair and Boris Karloff has like a cup, a of, cup tea of tea or that, that one was for sure at the yeah. Guillermo del Toro. Benicio del Toro was also the Wolfman, not directed by Guillermo del no, Toro. certainly not, no. <laughs> When's the Benicio del Toro <laughs> retrospective coming along? LACMA. Lon Chaney Jr. hated the process, which took nine hours, six hours oh to apply, God. three to take off. He hated being in a chair. He didn't care much for Jack Pierce. Fine. For the wolf, I loved Lon Chaney Jr. I also recognized that he was a real piece of work for Spider Baby. Like father, like, like son. son of Chaney. <laughs> During Spider Baby, uh, he was supposed to be kicking alcohol and he, the people were like, why does he keep eating oranges? Because he was injecting vodka into <laughs> oranges and then eating them. So I get all the criticism. For the wolf man, there was some prosthetics used, like the no was the prosthetic and he like was ashamed that he didn't know how to do those plastics so he like outsourced it to somebody but he didn't really tell a lot of people but that's the only prosthetic used on the wolf man is the nose um some wigs like the pompadour were used and then hair pieces but lots of the body and the facial hair were painstakingly applied the yak's hair had to be applied in layers trimmed to look organic and then scorched with a curling iron from that it was curled and then blended to look set how many yaks were slaughtered, slaughtered. for this movie Wait, there's only two more yaks in the world and <laughs> And, uh, we only have enough yaks in the world for one more sequel. And we're getting tired of CGI. Practical effects are coming back. Coming back, yaks. Also, the Wolfman <laughs> has lower fangs that jut out, but no upper fangs. But like uh, that thing, that yeah, was also underbite. S- underbite, yeah. For the transformation scenes, it was shot using time lapse, and Lon Chaney would have to sit perfectly still. <laughs> four hours, sometimes five hours at a time, as they would shoot him in place. Then Pierce would come in, do a small phase of the makeup, then they would superimpose the changes, and then there was that on repeat for like what nine hours of that <laughs> um that was a transformation scene that they were just like we can just make you we can just like, no more walking into the dark and then coming out of werewolf yeah. no <laughs> we're gonna watch you change and again no one ever saw a werewolf look like this before there's so little human resemblance other than that you know he's dressed like a 40s mechanic but like he looked more wolf than man in that one like the were- werewolf of london it was like a dude in like british clothes he had like a, a <laughs> man man's face this one is like it's a wolf that's like walking up right it looks like a wolf man from this point on though he would continue working for universal but because the quality of the mon- monsters and the monster movies dropped mm-hmm. jack pierce wouldn't be creating as many masterpieces as he previously did people consider his work on claude rain's 1943 it's phantom of the opera as his last great work and it's an amazing piece of just exposed flesh on the Phantom's face was claude rain's or conrad veit the invisible man it was claude rain's, claude rain's was i the think in the, earlier in this episode i might have said it was conrad veit you're not smart um oh. but claude rain's was the 43 phantom of the opera it takes off the masters so exposed flesh people were really grossed out by this so i think he had to tune it back or they cut but that would people say that's his last great work and it's just mm-hmm. like this i motion to around my eye <laughs> uh there were more mummy movies more frankenstein movies and from that point on where the monsters would cross over into movies Pierce would be tasked with having to do the makeup on several monsters in one picture. And because you can't spend eight hours applying makeup to three monsters, yeah. he would have to take shortcuts and use prosthetics. That, that's like House of Frankenstein yes. where like everyone's in it. It's like just uh, exactly. here's some toilet paper, be the mummy. <laughs> put this fake beard on yeah. and put a bunch of fake beards on until it's, it covers uh, up. Busy parents on Halloween. Busy parents. My, uh, my parents on Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to cover you in foil and you can be Robocop. So the craftsman look of his work really peeled away. By the time he we get to the mummy's tomb in 1943 and the mummy's curse in 1944, launch Jr. Jr. was again on the seat and he did not want 
to go through the arduous makeup for the mummy. So Jack Pierce created a, his first rubber latex mask mm-hmm. that he would wear. And he did the best that he could. The rubber mask may very well be the only artifact left behind from Jack Pierce's career that was in, used That's in the sad. movies. Yeah, Bob Burns, I think, has it, which is like the, the horror collector. By 1947, though, his meticulous methods of movie makeup, which I wanted to say out loud, were not working for the <laughs> studio anymore. And they didn't really care about his craftsmanship anymore. They wanted fast work done cheap, and they no longer cared about the quality. Right. Universal at the time merged That's with- doesn't sound like a movie studio. Uh, especially Universal. <laughs> Universal at the time merged with International Pictures after a decade of changing studio heads. Once the merger was done, many of the heads of different departments were fired. Jack Pierce was let go from his position. He worked for 19 years as the head of the makeup department for Universal. He would be replaced by Bud Westmore. Mm-hmm. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> who would go on to Bud. abuse West. West. No more. <laughs> From this point, Jack Pierce would be doing B movies and TV gigs, including the great TV show. He did you the makeup are- for B movie. <laughs> He did uh, makeup for You Are There, which is a great show. I, I mostly know it as a radio thing. Oh, yeah. I think I've heard of it. It was the like radio. A, uh, they pretend to be, their yeah. real journalists pretend to be on site for like the conquest of Mexico or Pearl Harbor, and they pretend to be interviewing people. It's right. like a historical show that I wanted to do, a similar thing, but comedy, but you shot me down because you don't like anything I like. Much like Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Much like Pearl Harbor. In 1957, Boris Karloff was a guest on the anxiety inducing show, This Is Your Life. Uh. And he guessed almost automatically the clue was it took us about four hours and by this time <laughs> Boris is laughing his surprise guest was Jack Pierce on This Is Your Life and it's really beautiful to see these guys shake hands he like he goes up towering over Jack Pierce. You know, Boris Karloff <laughs> don't rub it in Boris looks so you ever getting back in the baseball no. kiddo <laughs> what are you like an ump now Boris Karloff compliments him calls him the best makeup man in the world and it's like genuinely like I, I love both these guys and I love yeah, Boris, Boris Karloff. Karloff is a class act class act and he just seems so happy to see Jack Pierce Jack Pierce brings him an electrode uh that Frankenstein would wear. One more time. One more time. <laughs> One more time, I got Jack. spirit gum in my pocket. I always carry it on me. <laughs> I've got P- grease paint, whatever that is. Uh, and Pierce asks if... Karloff remembers, do you remember coming over to my place in Encino to start work on Frankenstein? I tried looking it up and I couldn't find a place in Encino, an address. So I asked Maria from, who we know from the Andres Pico Adobe, who runs the Hollywood Exhumed Instagram, where she's always going to the homes of famous people. I asked her, like, hey, do you know where Jack Pierce lived? And uh, she's like, let me ask Glenn Strange's niece. I was like, what? She found that Jack Pierce lived in Hollywood and Sherman Oaks later in his life. But she did find an address of his in Van Nuys, 4851 Havenhurst near Magnolia. But it's demolished, so don't go looking for it. But then she's like, oh, I got help from Marty McFly from SFV blog. I'm like, what's real and what's not? What's a movie? I can't remember. <laughs> what year is it? What? The actor? Year. <laughs> is it Twin Pines or Lone Pine? I need to know now. <laughs> is Biff cool or not? <laughs> what reality am I living in? <laughs> is he in Trump Tower or is he washing mom's car? I need to know. <laughs> or is he somewhere in between? So by the time Jack Pierce passes away in 1968, his last well-known gig was working as the makeup department head for Mr. Ed. <laughs> If you like Mr. Ed, you must be thinking, how cool. If you don't like Mr. Ed, what a sad end for a true self-taught innovator and the man who visually created motifs we use almost 100 years today. In 2003, the United States Post Office did a series celebrating American filmmaking behind the scenes. The stamps... Serling's here. So they wanted to do stamps commemorating them in behind the scenes. The stamp it's in question shows Boris Karloff being transformed into the creature and Jack Pierce's hands applying the makeup. (laughs) I'm going to do my Aaron Mankey now. Uh. That's right. His hands. In a series celebrating behind the scenes work, UPS decided to show his hands and not his face because who cares what he looks like because he's not in front of the camera. Here's to you, Jack Pierce. Jack Pierce's hands, the only parts that matter. Insulting. but He played a thing, though. <laughs> the R2-D2 of the uh, Adam's <laughs> Family world. But just before his death, TV stations would buy monster movie packages and began replaying them on TV, inspiring a new generation of kids to fall headstone over heels for monsters and the insane monster movie fandom of the 60s made kids like Joe Dante and John Landis worship the behind the scenes players like Jack Pierce. He was regularly featured in Famous Monsters Filmland, another staple for monster kids of that generation. So while his career seemed to have dried up near the end, I hope he had a few years of knowing how incredibly important his work was and how many people he inspired. As his work is... Truly iconic. Well, at least his hands are. <laughs> See that work on Mr. Ed? <laughs> that guy's knocking on the bark. That wasn't even a horse. <laughs> <laughs> that was Boris Karloff. Horace Karloff. So look, we're we're about the midway point, yeah. I guess a little more, but we're going to take a break now. Soak in, uh, go buy some stamps. Go and, buy some stamps, um, put some faces on it. We'll see you after this uh, brief break. Sponsored break. Money. 
We'll see you after this quick deposit into our bank account. <laughs> see you soon. This episode is brought to you by Smile Brilliant. If you're like me, you're a bit overwhelmed by all the teeth whitening products on the market. This next sponsor has provided me with some very interesting facts to pass on to you. Fact number one, teeth whitening does not whiten your teeth. It removes the stains and restores the tooth to its natural color. Natural color is vary per person, but for most, it's an off-white or slightly yellowish undertone. My yellowish undertone is an overtone. It's not over slight- by overtone. <laughs> and it's not slightly off-white. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like I just ate brownies fact number two teeth whitening does not damage teeth but it does temporarily dehydrate when dehydrated the pores in the enamel are open and exposed open pores invite acids and sugars which as we all know lead to tooth decay avoid or minimize acidic and sugary substances for at least 24 hours after whitening also avoid staining substances as the teeth are far more susceptible to restaining during this period not only are my teeth completely discolored but somehow they're also stained (laughs) My teeth look like a Jackson Paul tiles. <laughs> Fact number three, tooth sensitivity is a result of tooth dehydration. When the pores of the enamel are open, the teeth become dehydrated, exposing the nerve to the elements. As the tooth rehydrates, the sensitivity will dissipate. To accelerate the rehydration and curb sensitivity, use a post-whitening application known as remineralization or desensitizing gel. Not only are my teeth discolored and stained, but they're so sensitive that whenever I open them, they recoil back into my gums. Fact number four, caps and veneers cannot be whitened because they do not have pores for the stains to latch onto. Prior to having dental work, you should whiten your teeth, restoring them to their natural color as the dentist will be color matching to your current shade. Not only are my teeth discolored, stained, and recoil whenever I open my mouth, but they've tried to put veneers in. They reject it. My body rejected them. Fact number five, the key to teeth whitening is the delivery device. So long as a whitening product is a peroxide-based whitener, it will remove the stains. What differentiates one product from the next is a device that holds the whitening agent to the tooth without interruption. Whitening strips neglect the crevices and molars and they slide on your teeth. Saliva floods the generic trays because they are bulky and do not create a seal. Oh, and you likely did not know this, but LED lights are novelty items that add no benefit. You need a high output UV light only found at the dentist. But why would I put up with all this? Why wouldn't I just go to a company that can do this the right way? Make my teeth look human the right way. And that's where Smile Brilliant comes in. The number one whitening device recommended by dentists is the custom fitted tray, Greg. You can have your dentist make your trays for $300 to $600, or you can head to smilebrilliant.com and use their lab direct mail-in process for a fraction of the price you would pay at the dentist. Those nasty people. We all know what they do. Haven't you seen Marathon Man? That's who you want to go to? You don't have to go to the hiding Nazi doctor dentist anymore because you have smilebrilliant.com. And if you grind your teeth tonight, you can also purchase Smile Brilliant's custom fitted night guards once again for the fraction of the price that dentists charge. So that's smilebrilliant.com. And uh, hey, guess what? You can save even more money using the promo code LA Meekly for a special discount. If you want good looking teeth, you go to smilebrilliant.com. That's smilebrilliant.com. If your dentist is German by way of Argentina, don't go to him. <laughs> Oh boy, Greg, what an episode we're having. Um, this is the best one. I don't want it to end. And I'm not talking about the podcast. Oh, you mean the, the episode you're going through? Yeah, I've been going through something for the past hour and a half or so that we've been talking, but I, I got to have a break from my episode to let you know that this episode is sponsored by Podcorn. Our old friends, Podcorn? The oldest friends we've ever had, Podcorn.com. Podcorn is a marketplace connecting podcasters to amazing podcast sponsorship opportunities such as host read ads, interview segments, topical discussions, and more like this one. If you have a podcast, it will connect you with advertisers. For many a year, we were wondering how do we get to advertise for people and now we figure it out because of Podcorn. That's the great thing. It puts the power in your hands. With Podcorn, there's no middleman. Podcasters of all size can browse and choose opportunities right on the platform. Set your own rates and collaborate with the brands directly without any extra exclusivities. And here's the most important thing. You never give up any rights to your podcast. They found out how to, to get to me because for me, creative control is number one, even though it's a 5149, you, you usually go with whatever you say. So well, I have very little say in this podcast. for that sub sandwich one day. <laughs> Podcorn is also there to support you every step of the way and ensure that you're protected and compensated for the work that you do for brands. If there's any trouble, they'll help you out. Believe me. Uh, the, believe me. Believe. I've worked with some real con artists on this <laughs> 
Stabbing.com. The marketplace mission is to give podcasters transparency, creative freedom, and full control of how and when we monetize. So if you want to get started with this, click the link in our show notes to sign up to podcorn.com and start browsing sponsorship opportunities. Or just go to podcorn.com and you can start looking at all the fun things you can advertise. Whatever you want to add for. It's the sewer system of LA. This episode is sponsored by Elephant Funerals. And believe me, they will give you a little bit of trouble when you try to pay. <laughs> they, so they don't forget anything, but they suddenly forget get to pay you uh, not with podcorn <laughs> on the job so if you want to start advertising on your show go to podcorn.com podcorn.com alpha funerals are real and we're back wow our bank accounts are bursting at the seams there's not even enough bandwidth at chase to hold how much money we just made from those ads my velcro wallet is so happy right now my velcro bank account <laughs> is just bursting so yeah but we just heard about uh who'd we talk about we heard <laughs> who, who, who some guy with hands <laughs> what we just heard about the life and work of jack pierce i want to hear about ray bradbury's best man could you tell me about him please <laughs> his greatest credit <laughs> ray bradbury's best man he, who you just talked about was very interesting influential yeah. um so is this guy uh, <laughs> i was waiting for something really profound to be coming yeah. out and well here we are i look like an idiot once again in honor of my next subject i'm going to read this all one letter at a time and you're gonna have to play it back at double speed to see it is what i'm saying and yes it will take you 10 hours oh my God. that's because i'm talking about the legend the icon the fastidious dork, Ray Harryhausen. Oh boy. The king of stop motion animation. I remember watching Clash of the Titans as one of his, right? Yeah. Yeah. I saw Clash <laughs> of the Titans as a kid and I thought this is the greatest thing I've ever seen <laughs> in my wrong, life. You're wrong, but uh, I don't think that I am. I think that I'm still right. Born Raymond Frederick Harryhausen Good on name. June 29th, 1920, right here in Los Angeles. Oh, hometown hero. He, of course, was a dorky kid into dorky things like science fiction, which was barely being born the same time he was science yeah. fiction which was redundant thing to call it because there was barely even was there even science in the 20s just call it fiction fiction he loved all science was fiction back then <laughs> exactly it was either fiction or witchcraft <laughs> he loved this stuff and his parents were a hundred percent in supporting him that, liking this uh, no wonder him and Forey like who oh we love this stuff and our parents are totally on board yeah, with it <laughs> oh and no, we've had happy lives let's do it let's be best friends <laughs> let's be the nicest people and show the business nice together. Show business. <laughs> um, they encouraged him and helped him out in his burgeoning obsession, probably in large part because his dad was an inventor. So it was in his genes to be wow. into like, you know yeah tinkering eccentricity yes uh dorkism uh rube goldberg's all over the house oh, yeah Ru emphasis on rubes at an early age uh he was five when this came out he was exposed to a movie that would set him on a path without him even really knowing it yet this movie was the lost world oh yeah okay. uh, steven spielberg's <laughs> sequel to his hit <laughs> E.T. Um, <laughs> the Sugarland Express. <laughs> Based on the story by famed believer in fairies, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, right. about some people that end up in a world of dinosaurs for some reason, it was the first feature-length movie to ever use the technique that would go on to define Little Ray's future life, stop-motion animation. That's when you have inanimate figures, usually some sort of clay, and you'd expose them one frame of film at a time. You said that wrong. You'd painstakingly ex expose them one frame at a time <gasps> oh, over, the, You're missing over one the span word. of 10 years. Torturously. Torturously. So it'd be one frame of film, move the thing almost imperceptibly yeah. expose another frame and repeat until you were able to play back the film and have it look like this clay dinosaur was moving all on its own yes. and you spend 40 hours on 15 seconds of footage. It broke people, yeah. So The Lost World was the movie upon whose shoulders Ray would eventually stand upon, but he was a little kid at the time, so it didn't really sink in. But then eight years later, something hit him at just the right age like a flashbulb and a giant monkey's eye. <laughs> King... Kong. That's right. His parents brought him to see King Kong at the Chinese theater. And as he put it, I haven't been the same since. <laughs> Imagine going to it like, uh, it's about some royalty yeah. in England. I don't there's, know. I think, yeah, there's some king that has a pet. I, I don't yeah, know. I, I, I don't know. Let's just they go to New York. <laughs> he could not believe what he was seeing yeah. on the movie screen. Few people could, unless they had actually lived through a violent rampage of a giant romantic <laughs> ape. It was special effects as had never been seen yes. before. Like me seeing Avatar for the first time. The first 
first of many. The last airbender? Go ahead. <laughs> he knew enough that Kong wasn't just a guy in a suit. He could tell it wasn't a puppet because the way it moved, and he was pretty sure it wasn't a real ape. He just couldn't figure out how they did this. And that's when he was formally introduced to the process of stop motion animation, and that led to his unconditional devotion to movie animation. He said later in life, I find it all rather difficult to believe that in one afternoon, a film about a giant gorilla <laughs> had the influence to alter the direction of my entire life. You and me both, Buster. Also, what he that could just be the tagline of King Kong. <laughs> said everyone in New York in the movie. <laughs> the scenes that were cut at the end of news reporters interviewing everybody, that giant gorilla altered the course of my life. Uh, Imagine characters could write reviews of the movies they're in. <laughs> Scary, but fun. <laughs> Glad I'm alive. That monkey shouldn't have gone on the Empire State <laughs> Building. One I don't agree with what they did to him, but he should have he, known better. He, should, yeah. he was asking for it. <laughs> um, his parents being the supportive people they were, his dad built Ray a studio in their garage and little Ray got to work tinkering with puppets and figures and pretty soon he was making movies of his own in right. his parents' garage. He would film things with marionettes and attempted stop motion of his own on a 16 millimeter camera. His first complete thing he made was called the cave bear. And guess where he got the fur for the titular cave bear? Where? By cutting up his mom's fur coat. Oh my God. But, a bad boy. Uh, but, a literal bad boy. Not just bad, naughty. He's downright <laughs> naughty, Greg. But don't forget, they were supportive parents, so right. they didn't put him up for adoption and he was allowed to still live in the house after this. Could you Lucy, imagine? Lucy would have gotten it. Ricky would have put Lucy up for adoption if Lucy <laughs> pulled that, uh, which she never would. She was begging for a fur. She would never harm she a fur. She would never her, harm a fur. She would never harm a dead animal in fur coat. She'd have to live with the Mertzes if she did that. Not so bad. They had a pretty cozy apartment. <laughs> then when he was 18, he embarked on an insanely ambitious project he called The Evolution of the World, oh which was an God. entirely stop motion history of the creation of planet Earth to the rise of mammals. All stop motion. He worked on this for two years. Wow. But then he gave up in 1940 when a movie from earlier in this episode came out. Fantasia. Wow, okay. Featuring work from our old friend, M M Patrick. Maleficent Patrick. <laughs> uh, Ray saw the dinosaur sequence in Fantasia and thought, well, I'm never going to top that. So he just gave up on oh my God. That. But around this time, he made a lucky connection that would only have happened since he lived in LA. A friend of his in high school's dad once worked with a man named Willis O'Brien, who, wouldn't you know it, was the man who did the stop motion in The Lost You're World kidding. and King Kong. Really? This kid's dad breached all all privacy protocols and gave this 18 year old Ray Harryhausen O'Brien's phone number and he called him and shockingly O'Brien invited him to come visit him at his office at MGM Studios. That's all I want. A <laughs> freaking mentor. Someone to pluck me from obscurity and be like let me help you. All I need is to be in high school again. I could figure it out this time. <laughs> yeah. I, I know what I'm doing now. Ray wanted to make a good impression on the man who was literally responsible for everything he loved yeah. in life so he brought with him to MGM Studios a suitcase full of dinosaurs models he made to show him which is how I went anywhere for a big part of my life. What's in your lunchbox? Well, I've been working on I'm this working on little push. thing. <laughs> Out of a moving car. So, yeah, suddenly I look like Igor with a broken no. spine. Yeah, isn't that adorable? That's that adorable. He... That is so cute. I just wanted to show off my triceratops. It's really nice and it's got three horns. And then I have another one. It's a really long neck one and another one. LAPD. <laughs> um, Get this kid a badge. Okay. O'Brien didn't seem entirely impressed, but instead of crushing an 18-year-old self Steam. Didn't seem impressed. He, this eight-year-old sucks. He, uh, 18 year old, <laughs> oh, 18, not okay. eight-year-old. He, instead of crushing his self-esteem, he encouraged Ray to take art and anatomy classes okay. and some film classes while he was at it. So while he was still in high school, Ray took night classes at USC in art direction, photography and editing, and also acting. And he also took art classes at LA City College. Oh, wow, okay. um, there he studied 19th and 20th century artists on how they represented anatomy and musculature. Mm -hmm. In particular, Gustav Stav Doré, which will yeah. make complete sense if you Google something of his right mm -hmm. now. Go do it right now. We'll wait. Click, 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 click Google. Uh, click, click. Oh, virus. You, you looked up hot babes, didn't you? Damn it. You I put va va voom into the Google search. <laughs> I put hourglass. Around this time, he also met another influential dweeb who we've talked about before, mm -hmm. Forrest J. Ackerman, who invited him to join our old clan of dorks hanging out, drinking limeade <laughs> up in Clifton's, the Los Angeles Science Fiction League. And this was where he met people so of one mind with him, not least 
least of all being another old dweeb we know <laughs> and fellow Ray, Ray Brad baby. The two hit it off so well that eventually in 1947, like you said, Ray Harryhausen was the best man at Ray Bradbury's wedding. And I can only imagine the number of Mars Venus jokes that they were making during that speech. Oh my God. But now Ray's out of high school and he has to start making a living as all self-respecting animation inclined people in LA do around that time in their lives. He applied to work at Disney, which he did not get join the club. <laughs> did the Mandalorian tell him he wasn't qualified either? <laughs> Boba Fett told him. <laughs> it was a, a different time. It was Jango Fett <laughs> way back then. Uh, but he later said that this was actually the best thing that ever happened to him since seeing King Kong. This is because one day he went to a Navy surplus store and found a thousand feet of 16 millimeter color film that he knew he had to do something with. So he bought it and decided to make a series of stop motion mother goose stories that he planned to sell to TV and schools to show to children. All this with not only the financial support, but also the physical support of his mom and dad. His mom made costumes for the figures and did set dressing while his dad built the sets and made the skeletal metalwork for the models he used, which is the thing that he would do for all of Ray's work from then on, even in major Hollywood wow. movies until his dad died in 1962. Wow. Uh, he made four of these Mother Goose 10 minute shorts over five months. And then in 1940, based on the merit of these Mother Goose shorts and his incomplete work on the evolution of the world, he got a real job working on something called Puppet Tunes. Oh, that sounds for familiar. Paramount. Didn't um, Bob Baker work for Puppet Tunes? That does sound briefly? kind of familiar. Well, these were a series of stop motion puppetry shorts that were right up his alley, and he got paid $16 a week to live in that alley until 1942 <laughs> when World War the Second one hit and right. puppets had to be melted down into bullets. You're getting shot with my best friend. <laughs> this was a stegosaurus I made in high school. Pat, <laughs> I'm saving this giant lizard I made for Hitler himself. <laughs> right between the eyes. The good American he was Ray joined the army in the Signal Corps, but once word got out on his unique set of skills that are of absolutely no use in combat, he was transferred to the Special Service Division where he was assigned to help make the Why We Fight series of propaganda films overseen by the bloodthirsty killing machine that was Frank Capra. That's right. I wonder if he worked at all with Ted Geisel. Oh, well, Greg, shut up a second. Shut up your face. But he got requested to help with a side project by a major who was creating a new series for the Army's animation studio and needed a model sculpted of a character this major was making named Private Snafu. Snafu so right. Ray Harryhausen helped create Private Snafu for Major Ted Geisel, a.k.a. Major Dr. Seuss. The doctor? The doctor's a major. In 1946, isn't that, what a, what like, a wh- while people are like dying at the Battle yeah. of the Bulge and they're, he's. Dr. Seuss, Ray Harryhausen, and Chuck Jones are like. And so Frank should, Capra. And Frank Capra. <laughs> so uh, Booby Trap, we're going to go for the pun, right? Everybody? It's, it's right there. In 1946, the carnage was over and Ray left the army and continued making Mother Goose shorts uh-huh. and some TV ads, but then he finally got his big break that wouldn't be interrupted by a war by his old mentor, Willis O'Brien. Okay. O'Brien was working on a new stop motion ape movie called Mighty Joe Young. Oh, right. And he needed someone to help with doing photo tests and building armatures and who better than the kid who dragged a trunk of homemade dinosaurs to his office at MGM. Yeah. But that was just the job description. In reality, as the production went along, Ray started doing the movement and animating of Joe Young himself. Wow. I think the monkey's called Joe Young. I've never seen it. Uh, He certainly sounds mighty, at least. He's not royalty, but he's mighty. (laughs) This is the people's Kong. And by the time the movie was done, Ray had done over 90% of the work on animating Joe Young. The two didn't know it at the time, but this was really the passing of the torch between the two generations Mm -hmm. of stop motion animation. And the movie was a big hit that won an Oscar for special effects that was given directly to Willis (laughs) O'Brien. And and Bud was more on the way to take it. (laughs) Like the Secret Service protecting (laughs) the president from a bullet. He grabbed the Oscar. To his credit, though, O'Brien later admitted Ray did all the work and actually gave him that Oscar. Oh, wow. okay. But the crazy, ne- which, why would you accept it? Like They called your name. What are you gonna, I can't go up because actually uh, this 18 year old um, But like, I- even if if like years later, this old man who has an Oscar is like, eh, you should take my Oscar. Like, you're gonna be like, yeah, thanks, finally. Cool, I had a space on my drawer for it. <laughs> it's been there for years. Waiting. My mantle's pretty lonely. It's got a bunch of dinosaurs, but no golden men. 
the one model I couldn't make. <laughs> the, but the crazy network of connections Ray had made over the years didn't stop giving here. He was still friends with one of the biggest names ever in sci-fi, though my feelings on him are well documented, even though we share a lot of parallels. Ray Bradbaby, Bradbury. who had sold the rights to his story, The Foghorn, to Warner Brothers to be made into a movie called The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. And Ray got Ray the job of being the animator for the movie. Oh, wow. Okay. This was his first lead title on a feature film. Now, Ray wanted to make a good impression and he had room to shine because the centerpiece of this movie is a dinosaur destroying New York City. Right. New York City. Uh, Ray was, of course, obsessed with making his stop motion look as realistic as possible. And to do that, he created a patented technique he called Dynamation. Dynamation, or as it was also later known as Dynorama, Super Dynamation and Dynamation 90, uh, meant that instead of just plopping a clay dinosaur in the middle of a doll-sized model of New York, the miniature would have a rear screen projection behind it of real footage of the streets of New York City, but with a spot in it blocked out in the shape of the miniature, and then the stop motion miniature would go in that missing gap filmed in front of this screen, so it looked like the dinosaur was actually walking through the streets of New York. Okay. Kind of like a green screen before before green even existed. Right. There were live actors reacting to the part of the screen where the dinosaur was, and it worked. Like People called this movie gasp-inducing, and the British Board of Film Classification gave the movie an X rating because it was so realistic and because the dinosaur became a gigolo. <laughs> this dinosaur just got here from Texas and uh, he's got some plans to make some money. <laughs> all he has is a radio and he's hungry. <laughs> yeah, isn't that That's like, absurd? It, it's it's so crazy to think of like like King Kong and Frankenstein yeah. and this movie and even like people running out of the theater when a train's coming at the screen of like it's because it was ahead of schedule. <laughs> that was the scariest. That's a joke I made in the last one. But just as important as making his animations look realistic was to Ray, so was keeping his costs down. He knew he'd get more work if he could do the work on the cheap. So the creation of Dynamation, which was just a marketing gimmick name to make it sound special like Technicolor or the Boogaloo Boys, it was really just a manifestation of the cheapest way to do what he was trying to do. Right, okay. Not least of all because it could be done alone, which is how Ray usually worked on all his movies his entire career. At most, he would have two or three assistants, but usually it was just him. That that sounds like a control freak. He's trying to do things on the cheap, Greg. Don't just put him down. I'm not a control freak. Oh my God. <laughs> oh no. What? I've had a break. I flipped, the, t- <laughs> I flipped the table over. I blacked out and now <laughs> we're recording the next episode already. <laughs> and he rarely did more than one take on anything because it was too expensive and too time consuming to try to do anything with his creatures twice. Right. And you've got to use that word with him. Creatures. He said creatures, always creatures, never monsters. Why? Does he say why? Because they're not monsters. Oh, okay. Oh, a dinosaur's not a monster. It's a creature. A Medusa isn't a monster. She's a woman. She's a full body woman. I dare, I dare you. I dare, I dare to, I dare, 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 dare to disagree. Now with his first solo work on a major movie released in 1953, Ray got connected with an up and coming producer at Columbia named Charles H. Schneer, who was into what Ray was doing and the two hitched themselves to each other for the rest of both of their careers. Okay. Uh, with Schneer by his side, Ray did all the movies you know him from. It came from Beneath the Sea, mm-hmm. where a giant octopus destroys the Golden Gate Bridge that they only gave six tentacles okay. rather than eight because eight was too expensive. I was going to say as a joke, keep it on the cheap. I, he said something like, if things had gone a little differently, it would have been like a trictopus or something. He did Earth versus the Flying Saucers, where aliens destroy the Washington Monument long before Independence Day made it cool to do so. <laughs> Mysterious Island, where people get chased by a giant bee. One million years BC, where Raquel Welch gets kidnapped by a pterodactyl. Oh, right. The Valley of Gwangi, where a cowboy lassos a T-Rex. <laughs> the last of his so-called monster on the rampage movies was 20 million miles to earth in 1957 which Mm -hmm. had a space dinosaur fight an elephant at the Colosseum in Rome the movie should have been called that (laughs) 1958 marked a switch for him with the seventh voyage of Sinbad he now he focused not only just on more fantasy stories rather than sci-fi but also this was his first time working with color which added a whole new level of difficulty to his job because he had to now balance the color in the dynamation process between the live footage and his miniatures and and he can't have anyone help him with that. (laughs) I can't afford it. I want help, but it's not worth the expense. (laughs) But much like the cowboy lassoing a T-Rex, the level of dedication of Ray Harryhausen could conquer anything. He was deeply involved in his process, which meant that he had to be deeply involved with the making of the entire movie. Because not only did he have to sculpt, paint, and choreograph his models and how they'd interact with the other models in it, he had to choreograph how the models would interact with the live actors, which meant he was kind of the phantom director of any movie that he was working on. Because
because he had to coach and tell like Lawrence Olivier in Clash of the Titans. Yeah. Like, uh, actually, you got to look a little bit lower because Pegasus isn't that tall. Yeah. He had to be involved in every step of the movie making process wow. in a way that nobody else really has been on a major movie. So much so that often the movies he made would be written around what sort of effects he could make happen. Okay, so like, they were purely like Harry has in movies. They were vehicles for for like, I've got this idea. There's going to be a giant snake and he's yeah. going to ride a bike. And I'm, <laughs> oh, we're making bike snakes from outer space. Okay. Sidebar, apparently the gladiator scene in Attack of the Clones uh-huh. recreated moments beat for beat from the seventh voyage of Sinbad, which does not bode well for his legacy <laughs> but I, I'd, I'd love to see that side by side yeah there's someone on youtube should splice those two together the mashup we've all been waiting for <laughs> um the sequence he's probably best known for came in 1963's jason and the argonauts right. oh that's another good one that movie has an incredible sequence with a hydra which would have been enough but then he went and topped himself with the skeleton army mm-hmm. so the scene features seven stop motion skeleton soldiers who burst out of the ground and then go on to fight jason and two of his argonauts right. who are all huge they're, they're humans jason and the Argonauts are humans. humans. The skeletons are not humans. It only lasts maybe like three or four minutes, but each skeleton had 35 individual movements to make per frame. Oh so it took him four and a half months to film it and it looks great. Yeah, great. Apparently he was so proud of them that he used to carry one of the skeletons around in his pocket all the time just because he loved it so much. <laughs> Harry Harryhausen at the airport must have been great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the flights, the yeah. sorry everybody, the flights delayed. Oh, that's just like when Jason lost his ship to get home. <laughs> Anybody want to see a skeleton? <laughs> it's not real. <laughs> I'm not H.H. H. Holmes. I'm just carrying <laughs> skeletons in a briefcase. Ray's last feature movie came with 1981's Clash of the Titans, mm. which has Pegasus, the Kraken, an incredible Medusa, and of course, everyone's favorite R2-D2 ripoff, Bubo the Owl. Uh, that movie is so weird. It is very weird. It, it is very, like, of that 70s, 80s fantasy genre. Yeah, uh, of, like, all not really hunky, but we're supposed to think we're, they're hunky, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Mark Hamill-looking guys. Mark Hamill-looking guys. Kind of, like, overly sexual, but it's all under the surface of, like, this movie's really horny. Yeah, that's a weird movie. <laughs> but the movie. CGI is so oh, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. CGI. It's not CGI. The stop, the motion. stop motion is so yeah, the, good. The Kraken. I love it. Medusa's I love Medusa. Medu- Medusa is my favorite. Yeah, I think her eyes like glow for a second yeah. or something. Oh, it's so good. That's one of those movies where I'm like, I sh- I, I, I'm scared to watch it again. It's like, not good. It's not. A, well, I'll, look, I'll talk about okay. it. I, I keep hinting in this like uh, that movie's bad. We'll talk about the movie being bad. The budget of that movie was $16 million, oh. which was more than the combined budget of every other movie he had ever made up to that point. That's why it looks so good. But yeah. now it was the 80s and suddenly stop motion animation didn't hold people's attention like yeah. Duran Duran could. He was only in his 60s, but Hollywood kind of lost lost interest in his process. Right. They wanted realistic special effects like the special edition Job of the Hut. <laughs> also, movies were now all about space and the future, which he right. wasn't really into, which yeah. is kind of surprising. Uh, this was the beginning of CGI, which, while not always great, you can see the direct link between Ray's skeleton army and the Terminator at the end of the movie when it doesn't have the Schwarzenegger skin on. Right, like, yeah, yeah. They're the same thing, basically. Yeah. And it's all, it's also like, I, I think like Lucas and Spielberg were huge oh. monster well, also, movies talk kids. about that. Okay. The, George Lucas was actually stop motion made by Ray Harryhausen. <laughs> Nobody talks about it in the industry. <laughs> and he wasn't, Ray Harryhausen wasn't really a big fan of modern special effects. He right. said, if you make things too real, sometimes you bring it down to the mundane. Okay. I don't think you want to make it quite real. Stop motion to me gives that added value of a dream world, which obviously he's absolutely right about. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, when you're watching Clash of the Titans, like, how'd they get this this metal owl to fly around? <laughs> like, it's clearly fake, but it, it makes sense. He's right. And also in that the movement of stop motion things isn't always perfect, perfect or natural. And it gives it a weird dream. Like I'm having a dream. Like the skeleton. Army. Yeah. They don't move perfectly, but the yeah. way the way they move. I don't is like, want them to move. Perfectly. Exactly. I don't want them. To, I want them to look like a weird dream I'm having. Yeah. Because uh, I fell asleep during that movie because who snooze a fest mm. uh, by the mid 80s. He was mostly retired, spending his time writing some books and eventually working on some shorts again and overseeing the colorization of some of his old black and white movies. Movies. Ray Harryhausen died on May 7th, 2013 mm-hmm. in London, and over 50,000 of his old models and plans are now preserved by the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation, Ooh. which preserves his legacy and offers scholarships. But his legacy goes so much further than just this foundation. Apart from being universally recognized as being so nice, he made Tom Hanks sound like Gene Simmons. <laughs> the number of the biggest directors of our current generation that he influenced is unbelievable. Yeah. Like without, like now we can talk about it, without Ray Harryhausen, there would be no George 
George Lucas, no Steven Spielberg, no James Cameron, no Peter Jackson, no Guillermo del Toro, no Tim Burton, no Joe Dante. They all were inspired to do what they did because of Ray Harryhausen's work. It's compared, although in very different ways, of who has had a bigger influence on modern movies more either ray harryhausen or roger corman right like yeah. those two like roger corman gave everyone work but ray harryhausen inspired everybody who's Absolutely. making movies and while let's be honest most of the movies ray's stuff was in are not that great his work outshines the movies that they were right in. you watch it for those things exactly like i watched because i i knew like oh ray harryhausen so i watched clash of the titans i watched uh the one where he, the space monsters fight <laughs> elephants in the coliseum they're not good like right. they're they're, the movies themselves are quite clunky and not that great, but these scenes, these set pieces are so incredible right. to see. For the entire time, he was always just that wedgieable dork drinking limeade at Clifton's telling Ray Bradbury how cool it was when King Kong fought the dinosaur <laughs> for the 47th time. Uh, he said some people think- That's it, in the, the meeting of the minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Harry hasn't got up again. <laughs> the two Rays won't stop talking about King Kong. <laughs> he said, some people think it's childish to do what I've done for a living, but I think it's wrong when you grow up to be an adult to discard your sense of wonder. Good guy. Good Ray guy. Harry Hasen Legit good guy. Made some of the coolest moments in movie history in some of the worst movies. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew he passed in England, so I assumed that he was British. No, he moved, he moved to there. England in like 1960 or oh, something, okay. but no, he's from LA. Okay. I couldn't find where his house was. Nah, I don't know who to ask. It was probably the same house that Jack <laughs> Pierce lived in. Um, so now we're at the end of our episode. We right. got a, a listener question here. Okay. This one is from Bionic Dave on Instagram. Hi, Bionic Dave. Hi, Bionic Dave. He was actually, he was made by Ray Harryhausen too. Yeah, he doesn't know it yet, but he'll find out one day. <laughs> Chiropractor's in the town. Why don't... <laughs> Why do I have this battery pack? In my yeah. <laughs> so his question is, do you have prepared earthquake bags in your car trunks? You should. That's not a question. That's a command. <laughs> it's a, it's it's a question that turned into a directive. I do. My mom for well, my birthday gave me a backpack because yeah. my mom is Sarah Connor. She <laughs> gave me a backpack with an emergency kit. So I kind of know what's in there. I know there are snacks in there and I can't eat them. Uh, batteries <laughs> and... Uh, I can't eat those either. <laughs> I do. I made mine, but it's pretty weak. Like, because yeah. we, we had an earthquake just a couple weeks ago and every single time that happens, I'm like, I got to buy a new can yeah. of beans, <laughs> but I never do. I love that. It's always food with you. Always, every single <laughs> what time. What do you need at the end of the world if not a can of beans? Water! <laughs> <laughs> drink the bean juice. <laughs> Greg, drink That's the, the bean juice. That's the great thing about beans. They're <laughs> also liquid. <laughs> you're dehydrated when you go on a three mile walk because you've been <laughs> drinking bean juice to keep hydrated. <laughs> That's why I don't have an emergency pack because yeah. I, I was on a walk that went on for an hour and a half and I thought I got to crack into I'm this gonna thing. I'm going to die. Where's my space blanket? Where's my space blanket? Uh, yeah, mine has like, I think we talked about the- yeah. the uh, That's what kits. Yeah, but the, no, the Hanson's- uh, fruit punch oh, thing. Oh, right. Or the Hanson smoothie. Like there's some sort of canned juice and like beans yeah. and tuna and like tissues and there's masks. Okay. Um, and I have like a blanket and some sort of a solar powered charger oh, that I'm right. pretty, that I think I got for free at the library and I'm pretty sure will not work when I need it. I think I have a flashlight that probably has dead batteries in right. it. Yeah, it should be updated. Yeah. But in reality, I'm going to last for like one meal on that and that's it for me. I'm going to eat the backpack. <laughs> That used to be the best day, like when in elementary school, when they'd make you at the beginning of the year, bring in an emergency pack just in case. Yeah. And then at the end of the year, they'd give it back to you. That was the greatest day of my life because I would have a Nature Valley bar. <laughs> I'd have a fruit roll up. I've had a can of beans to stay hydrated. You got your deposit back. <laughs> in space. <laughs> but yeah, I, I should have better. Like there should be a Swiss Army knife. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. There should yeah. be like, uh, utensils. Yeah, and, uh, a, a, um, the number for the direct line to the president should be in there. At the end of our earthquake episode. A map episode. to the Denver airport a book on latin uh, <laughs> at the denver airport the illuminati's in the name you say some of this stuff. A, sign, a book of occult symbols <laughs> yeah at the end of our earthquake episode we go over what would be good in an earthquake kit so yeah. if you want to hear our ideas and i don't remember now uh, there's a good place to go probably a star map i don't know <laughs> gotta find out christina ritchie's house <laughs> that's what i meant by a star map not something to navigate by the stars i meant a map to the stars home yeah, is what the I stars need. home like all good sailors have <laughs> 40 yards beyond this, we'll get to Tab Hunter's house. Head east at John Voigt's house <laughs> and go until you reach Don. <laughs> Don Wells. So yeah, if you want us to become as big as Don Wells, why don't you leave us a review on iTunes uh, on your podcast app on your iPhone or if you go to rate 
mypodcast.com. Right, which is a link on our link tree. Yeah. yeah, you can easily do it through there. Uh, it helps us get more noticeable and seem more legitimate, mm-hmm. which we obviously are not. And uh, it helps us out. It really yep. helps us out. Or if you can also want to help us out financially on Patreon, mm-hmm. look at patreon.com slash LA Meekly for as little as $5 a month, you will get a handwritten postcard every single month. Every single month. A different postcard from a different LA landmark or some that Daniel has printed himself. Which I, pr- are I got a stack of 500 postcards the other day and... Uh, I regret it. <laughs> <laughs> I now sleep on a bed of postcards. <laughs> oh, also, and for you, don't have to give that much. You can't give. You could give just a dollar a month, and we'll mm-hmm. still say your name on the show, and we appreciate it. And we certainly appreciate it. You can check out our website. La Meekly Podcast is now up. All of our episodes are on there. They're cut into segments. Everything you need. Mm-hmm. I, I put in a search bar so you yeah. can search oh, in fantastic. like Don Wells, and you can see our Don Wells uh, four part episode yeah, that we did yeah, on Gilligan's Island and uh, that <laughs> Space Truth Coast section. episode. Space Coast episode where the cast of this living cast of Gilligan's Island comes out. And I'm like, are they being made fun of? Cause that's not fair. You can uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are working on a new video for that, but also we have all of our episodes and mm-hmm. segments on there and older stuff. Follow us on Instagram at LA underscore meekly or Twitter at LA meekly or our personal Twitters, our personal Twitters. I'm Grego underscore Gonzo on Twitter, Grego Gonzo on Instagram at DM Zafrin. On Twitter. That's all I need. I can, I'll, I'll make a tweet. I'll get two likes for it on a good day. So that was our October episode. Uh, I nothing hope you go, scary. Nothing Don't scary. Be scared. Feel free to watch all of these movies in October yeah. to rev up for Halloween. And if you're lucky, you'll see Jack Pierce's hands. You'll see Jack Pierce's sweet <laughs> and don't, hands. For, don't forget to watch my favorite Halloween movie, Charlie Chaplin's Limelight, where Millicent Patrick is an extra ballerina or something. <laughs> October 30th, yeah, make sure that you <laughs> land on Mr. Ed. <laughs> the scariest universal monster, <laughs> Mr. Ed. Mr. Ed. And for Halloween, you can watch the scariest thing that I've ever seen, This Is Your Life. <laughs> a show where they bring a guest out and you have to guess who's behind the curtain based on clues. And if you forget it wrong, everyone's sad. I inspired you in second grade to write... I don't know. Are you Bud Westmore? Mm. Tell me if you're... You uh, have to tell me if you're Bud Westmore. Is it Arthur Miller? <laughs> I cheated on the president with you. <laughs> Norma Ray? <laughs> I'm thinking of Norma Jean. Who am I thinking? Uh, who cares? Yeah. Who cares what I'm thinking? Nah, not uh, me. So have a good October, everybody. Uh, see, do everything you can for Halloween because it's uh, slightly safer this year. Yeah. yeah so uh, party on, uh, party Wayne. on, Garth. Uh, <laughs> as we end every episode, <laughs> and we'll see you in November. That's been yet another episode of La Meekly, being the podcast equivalent of Jack Pierce's hands on a U.S. postage stamp since 2013. 2013. You won't let it go. Okay, what yeah. I need is Bud West less. Or like not my Bud Westmore. <laughs> like Butt Westmore. There's so much. There's People could have slammed him. They had so much ammunition to <laughs> slam him back then. And they didn't because people were cowards. Because people were cowards and they would never work in the industry again. <laughs> much like we won't. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>